Hello all, and welcome to a new episode of the Horror Countdown Podcast. I'm your host, Donna Nelly, and with me tonight is my friend, Ian Urza. Hello. Hi. Thank you uh, for coming on board. Yeah. thought this uh, sounded like a pretty good pretty good idea because i know you like some of sergio martino's films and euro horror so i thought it sounded like a pretty good idea for both of us to talk about it yeah uh, indeed so um if that didn't uh, give it away or the uh, episode title uh today we are going to be doing our second director retrospective we're going to be doing our top 10 favorite sergio martino films so I mean, I, I've seen you around in the community. I know how much of a fan you are of him. But uh, for everyone else, uh, just get a, a little bit of a background into uh, what he means to you, why you uh, chose this particular topic, and uh, anything else you want to uh, let everybody know before we get started. Yeah, I mean, when I first started watching Giallo films, I actually kind of had a hard time getting into them a little for a little bit. And then when I started watching his it kind of all clicked where after that I started liking them a lot. Some of the Fulci and Argento ones I didn't actually like the first time I saw them, and it took me repeat viewings. With Martino's, I think I've liked a lot of the things he's done, and I've also gone through a pretty deep dive on Italian cinema in general, and he's probably the most versatile genre director. You're talking about a guy who made multiple spaghetti westerns, he made a cannibal movie, he made a couple of post-apocalyptic films, and, you know, even most people don't talk about his sex comedies or sexy comedies uh, because they're they're not actually what you might expect. I've seen one of them and I've seen a couple others by other directors. And most of the time their films predicated on a woman's sex appeal within the plot. But they don't actually have like a lot of nudity or sexual stuff in them. They usually just there. There's usually slapstick comedy based on that stuff. But he's kind of the king of that genre. A lot of people don't really talk about it because they're not exactly easy, easily accessible films. But, yeah, I just think he's probably the most versatile out of all the Italian genre filmmakers because of his work in multiple different subgenres. Yeah, um, I mean, in terms of um, I, I, I think the title would be like a little beneath him based on his output. But if we we're going to talk like the journeyman like Italian cult directors um, like, you know, him, Lindsay, um, uh, maybe, you know, Matai or uh, somebody like an Alberto De, De Martino, who I, I can't really say that they would have like maybe like a def definite, uh, you know, like there's like a defined period or like part of their filmography that you can say, well, you know, like Fulci, you know, with his splatter stuff or, you know, Argento with the Giallo stuff, like you can't really like pick out like a defined part of their filmography. Like they bounced around from like whatever was popular at the time. I, I, I definitely would look at Martino as like the best of that trilogy. Um, I, I, I wouldn't put him up with like the Bava, the Martino, the Bava, the Fulci, the Argento of the genre, but like the top of like the top rung down, at least. Um, I, I, I think that's pr probably where he stays. Um, I I'd probably say that he's like the best of the one. He's like the best of the rest, essentially, where. Like you said, if you've gone through, you know, Bay of Blood and Don't Torture a Duckling and Lizard and Woman's Skin and, you know, the the Animal Trilogy, this his are probably, like, the next best bets to try to, like, get into the genre. I mean, you know, I could probably list off a couple of others that would, pro you know, like, one-shot entries that would fit just as well, but... In, in terms of like a director's output, I I'd definitely say that he's one of, if not the best of like the journeyman directors where he doesn't have like a definite style or like a definite genre choice for people to latch onto. But in terms of like a, an output of work and a, like a solid overall catalog, uh, he's definitely one of the most underrated out there. So uh, yeah, I'm uh, definitely glad you got to choose him because uh, there's a lot of favorites. Um, this was a, I, I wouldn't say this was an extraordinarily tough one, but uh, yeah, I, I spent a little bit more time slotting and picking uh, these um, than I initially figured. But 
Yeah, just to follow up what you're saying real quickly, I think in terms of just Giallo, just that particular genre, he is my second favorite director. It's it's he's right after Argento when it comes to that particular subgenre. But I kind of agree in terms of total output. I think I'd probably put Fulci and Bava ahead of him, because if you look at outside of the Giallo, Sergio Martino really only made two true horror films i guess if you include two tales of the scorpion that would be another one although it's perfectly uh, fine to ignore that movie because I, 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 i'd probably say outside of giallo's there's three because yeah, um, yeah there, there's well, well no but there's yeah. three because there's mountain of the cannibal god there's island of the fishmen and then oh, there's yep. great alligator river yeah i was kind of island of the fishmen was the one i was like that one yeah, technically is as well. That that movie I actually had a lot more fun watching the second time I saw it. Actually, uh, so yeah, I mean Island yeah, of the one... Fi- yeah, I mean Island of the Fishmen or Screamers, whichever um, version you want to talk about. But and then in terms of just versatility, real quick, I think Ruggiero Diodato is another name that people don't talk about as much because they usually just talk about Cannibal Holocaust and maybe the last, the house. Uh, what is it? The house on the edge of the park. But yeah. there, he did some Giallo movies in the late 80s. I think he may have done a Spaghetti Western at one point, but he also did a Euro crime movie. So he he also worked in in several other genres as well, mostly one offs. But people mostly remember him for Cannibal Holocaust. Yeah, which is actually kind of funny because, um, I mean, not to you know get sidetracked on a Diodato discussion, but um, I actually saw Last Cannibal, um, Last Cannibal Jungle first. Yeah, that's actually a very good movie. That's yeah, actually uh, a scarier movie than Holocaust is, I think. And it's got it's got an interesting idea to it. Like it's basically I'll, yeah. I'll make this quick, but basically it's about how it's it's simply about how, uh, you know, the only difference between, you know, us civilized people, I guess, and our primitive selves is just a few days without food. And then you can start right. acting exactly like they do. Yeah, um, I, I I think Holocaust is rightfully a little bit uh, more remembered for the wrong reasons. Um, I, I I don't want to slight Holocaust at all, but I I think it's it's rightly remembered for the wrong reasons in that, yeah, you kind of have to overlook absolutely horrific and almost indefensible material, but. In terms of it being a well-made film, if you remove all of that, I I, I think Holocaust has a little bit more to say to it than Jungle. But, uh, you know, I mean, again, that's, you know, getting into a a conversation on another director. The ideas are more macro in it. Yeah. um, From a bigger perspective. Right. Yeah. But, um, I mean, that's, you know, Deodato discussion and uh, we're here talking Martino. So, um, I mean, I was saying this real quick, but, um, I mean, I know that there's you know, this is probably going to be a lot of Giallo, but I, I do have um, a couple of his non-genre films on here. So I didn't know if you were in that same mindset where you wanted to keep it strictly horror or, you know, if appropriate, mix in his uh, other works with uh, the genre output. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I, I one of the reasons I wanted to do this was because I wanted to talk about some of his other films. I'm a huge fan of the Euro crime genre. I don't know how familiar you are with that, but he did like three or four films in there. And one of them is actually a Giallo uh, Euro crime or Poliziotesky, as it's called in Italian, a hybrid of both of those, the suspicious death of a minor. But there are a couple others he did that I really enjoy as well. Yeah, um, I've seen only a few. Um, unfortunately, a vast majority of my career has been spent watching um, what I like to say as what's on TV. So um, if it wasn't available on broadcast TV, I wasn't uh, overly familiar with it. So um, it, it took me um, quite a while to get into uh, streaming, you know, like finding stuff online and, you know, spending a lot of my time watching, you know, like Tubi and Hulu and Netflix and YouTube and, you know, all those kinds of sites. I mean, I, you know, for the longest time was stuck with, you know, what was on cable TV. So if it wasn't on cable TV or if I didn't, you know, pick up the DVD or Blu-ray or VHS, then I wasn't um, I, I was aware of it, but I haven't seen it. And it's only been recently that I've gone back and started to uh, revisit a lot of that stuff. So 
Uh, for me, unfortunately, um, all I can say for uh, Poliziotesky films are two Arrow box sets. Uh, one called uh, Rogue Cops and Racketeers, and uh, yeah, the other those one. Those movies are great. Yeah, uh, the other one is uh, Years of Lead. Yeah, yeah. So, um, the the Rogue Cops and Racketeers has two of Enzo G. Castellari's better films. Um, the Heroin Busters is really fun, and yeah. the Big Racket is kind of like what he does best, where he basically makes you so angry at the villains that you're like, oh, what the cop is doing to to just go out and kill them is the right thing to do, <laughs> basically. Yeah. And then uh, the other one, The Years of Lead, has one I really like called Highway Racer, which is a really fun fun movie, basically yeah. Italian Fast and the Furious. Yeah, that was uh, my favorite of the five um, from that set, at least. But uh, yeah, um, those two box sets and then maybe a film we're going to talk about later tonight constitutes uh, my uh, at least uh, viewing experience of Palizio Teske. Not that I'm uh, unfamiliar with other stuff, but uh, at least in terms of, you know, what I can say I've seen, uh, you know, we're probably talking like less than a dozen. So, yeah. And uh, the funny thing is, is I, from what I've heard from you, I actually predict that we're going to have the same number one. If not, it's going to be very close. So, uh, uh, from what I've seen in the, um, from what I've seen of you online, I predict we'll probably have a top five that'll be interchangeable. I think. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I can't say like where they'll slot, but yeah, I would be pretty, fam- I would be pretty confident in saying. Um, our top three may be indistinguishable by I'm three, two, one, you're two, three, one. Yeah. So I, I think that's probably going to be uh, the way it goes, but um, yeah. So uh, if you have anything else, we want to uh, dive into our lists. Yeah, that sounds good. All right. So uh, for me, um, I'll start off at number 10. Um, my pick is Mountain of the Cannibal Gods. And uh, the only reason for this one is uh, the animal cruelty. Um, a- as much as I like the film, I, I think it's a great uh, starter uh, to the uh, Jungle Holocaust uh, series. I I don't think it's the best of the series. I say it's the perfect entry point because it gives you an idea of what you're going to expect, but it's you can find lesser entries and you can find better entries, but I, I don't like the idea of introducing people to the best entries because I think that sets an unhealthy standard. Whereas if you introduce them to the weak entries, then you're introducing them to the absolute crap and why am i going to watch anything you know if you want to introduce somebody i think you always want to introduce somebody something to it has a lot of the elements that are going to be present but it's easily topped and it's easily you know it this easily beats others so it lets others go out and explore for themselves what they want to do and you know let them see for themselves if it's something to you know try for themselves so that's kind of where I stick with, with this one. And, you know, it, it doesn't have, you know, the best of the best. It doesn't have, you know, anything great, but it's solid and serviceable enough. You know, there's some great performances in there. There's, you know, yeah, you're going to have to overlook the animal cruelty, but it's still a fun time. There's still a lot to like about it. But, you know, again, it's, you know, one of those where I, Outside of animal cruelty, the main thing that I always find with these is that I think they run <clears throat> 10 minutes too long. And I think that's the problem with this one is that it spends way too much time on just trekking through the wilderness that it kind of gets repetitive after a while. But I, I don't think that's necessarily anything that, you know, really overly holds this one back. But uh, for me, my number 10 is Mountain of the Cannibal Gods. Yeah, this one just didn't quite make the cut for me. It was at, I know it was going to be at like either my nine or 10 for a while. Then I bumped it off, but I do like this movie a lot. And I kind of agree with you that it's a good starting point for this genre. And it does have the animal cruelty in it, but it's a little bit, I I would say lesser so than some other movies. And most of it is kind of toward the beginning of the movie. If I remember, maybe not the very beginning, but that scene with like like the, 
that giant dragon lizard thing that they cut apart. And then you've got the snake right. monkey, but I don't think there's any actual animal cruelty later on. There is some uh, uh, pig bestiality, but uh, right. yeah, I don't know if there's any. The, I was trying to like, you know, skirt around that issue, but. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I guess, yeah, you can, I mean, I don't know. I guess you can. I just figured why not point it out, but maybe, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, uh, but I also think this one has a good adventure feel to it that's kind of why i like yeah. it because there's multiple scenes of them on rafts and stuff they run into an alligator at one point which is a really good yeah. scene you got that scene where the the guy gets hit by this big like swinging mace and he gets put in the trees and that's like that's and no one's helping him it's kind of funny uh you got ursula andrus looking like an absolute goddess uh and you've got one character who you kind of just hate and when he kind of gets his comeuppance you're like yes thank you finally <laughs> Uh, yeah. But then there's also a mystery to a lot of the other characters. And Martino was really good at that in a lot of his movies by making making things a little bit more interesting than they could be. Like with in particular, uh, Stacy Keach, he's kind of really understated. And then when he finally reveals that he had been kidnapped by that cannibal tribe, his performance gets a lot bigger. Uh, he starts, you know, you know, being much more emotional and, and animated. It's a pretty good performance by him in particular. And. You've got that, um, even though, I, and I agree with you that this movie's 10 minutes too long. I do like some of the adventure scenes, but I think they could have been cut a little bit, particularly the waterfall sequence. And even yeah, the that's, where, uh, to me, they, yeah, that's one of the, the, the big things is that I think that kind of just, it drags on a little bit longer than it should. And it just kind of makes it feel more like a tedious drag out to an end rather than, you know, you get the catharsis that a lot of them, a lot of the rest of the genre had. Whereas you look at, uh, you know, um, Holocaust and Ferox, I think they both they both have much stronger endings where they feel a little bit more impactful and they have a lot more, you know, it, 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 they, they end on stronger notes than this one because they're shorter, they're compact and they get, you know, they get to the point, whereas this one kind of drags it along. But I think yeah. that. I think you can probably pinpoint a lot of that. And then, you know, like you were saying with the adventure stylings, you can probably pinpoint that to the fact that because it's 75, I think the only other one that came before it is uh, Deep River Savages. So there's yeah. not a lot of, you know, there's not a lot to the formula yet. So, yeah, I, yeah there, no, there isn't. Yeah, so what I'm saying is that I think Hall, I think uh, the two Deodato films, um, Jungle and then Cannibal, Jungle Holocaust and Cannibal Holocaust, I think those are the ones that kind of set the formula. Because then you start seeing, uh, you know, Lindsay's second um, one eaten alive. You start seeing um, Zombie Holocaust have that kind of a setup. And then, you know, it turns into like a Dr. Moreau thing with, you know, at the end. And then there's, um, you know, Ferox again, which is kind of, you know, like a, a ripoff of, you know, everything else. And... I, I haven't seen uh, the two Jess Franco films from the early 80s. Uh, White I have Diamond, not either. Yeah, White Diamond uh, Terror, and uh, I, I think it's just called Cannibals. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't yeah, seen I either. Is. I haven't seen either of those, but I think they follow the. I think they both follow the same kind of formula that you know both Last Cannibal, Last Cannibal Jungle, and uh, Cannibal Holocaust followed. So it's not yeah, like think... the. Yeah, so it's not like the formula was set up yet, which, I mean, we, you and I both know that the Italians love the formula. So I, I think you can probably write off those issues to that fact. But it, yeah, I, in terms of the genre, I, I think it's it serves itself more as an entry point to, you know, OK, yeah, there's a few bits of animal violence and there's a few bits of cruelty that you have to kind of get over. But once you do that, then the film itself is still enjoyable enough to where you can say, yeah, I, I can tolerate that. It, you know, maybe let's see what these other films are about. I think that kind of is where this one serves its purpose. So. Yeah, I, I think in I mean, there is that uh there is it like in a manual in the last of the cannibals movie too that I have not seen, but yeah. Oh, I think I that one has that. Ivan Rasimov. Uh, yeah, I forgot well. about that. He's kind of the king of the genre. Him and probably Robert Kerman are the kings of the genre. Yeah, because um, yeah, there, I think Kerman's also in. Um, yeah, Kerman's in Last Cannibal Jungle, and then Rasimov is in uh, Eaten Alive. Yeah, so Rasimov is in yeah Eaten Alive. 
uh, Jungle Holocaust, and then Man from Deep River, and then Kerman is in Ferox. Uh, he has a yeah, he has a small part Ferox. Obviously, he's the star of Holocaust, and then he's in eaten, eaten Alive as well. Oh, he was. Yes. Huh. Uh, it's I think been he a has a smaller I've... role in it, but I think he's in that. Yeah, it's been a while since I've seen the uh, Eaten Alive. So, um, yeah, it, if he's in there, I, I might have forgotten about it. But, yeah, um, I guess uh, we'll uh, leave it at that. So uh, we'll move on to your number 10. Yeah, number 10, I had his Twilight Spaghetti Western, A Man Called Blade, also called Menage. I think that that's the other title for it. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, this I've one heard, has. Yeah, I've heard that one or Manaha, but I, Manaha, I, yeah. Yeah, I've heard both of those, but I, I, I think everybody knows what you're talking about. So. Sometimes those European pronunciations are weird, where maybe the J's could be H's or they could be Y's. You just don't know. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, cl- this close one enough. sees actually Maurizio Merli, who is normally a Eurocrime star, probably the biggest star in the Eurocrime genre, playing a Western gunfighter. It has sort of the. Uh, which you may call it the sort of the mercenary drifter main character, which is the thing that they did on a lot of spaghetti Westerns. And this one actually has a lot of similarities to Kaoma, which was kind of the other big Twilight spaghetti Western. Uh, they both kind of have, you know, a lone man wandering into a town where the people are being oppressed by someone. There's a fight between three people and like foggy, muddy, you know, downstage stuff going on. The main character is out to sort of, they both put it this way. They both both movies have an avengement of their father in some way, shape or form at some point in the story. They both have scores by Guido and Mauricio DeAngelis, and they both use the same vocalist uh, in some of those it, it, within that score. So they're very similar. This one has, you know, uh, Mauricio Marley throwing a hatchet at people, a lot, which is pretty cool. It's got this scene in the middle where basically these people are getting killed by these robbers and it's intercut with this burlesque da- or cabaret dancing crew, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's really, really cool. Uh, and yeah, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to think of other things, but that's, that's one of the reasons why I like the movie and it does something cool with, um, you know, this, the main character is out to avenge the death of his father, but he later finds out the guy who, who is responsible for his father's death is not, he's a bad guy, but he's not as evil as his right hand man. Who is played by John Steiner of all people. Who's awesome in villain roles in these movies. Uh, people right. Might remember him for playing the journalist in Tenebrae. Uh, the one who's obsessed with Peter Neal's work. He just died recently actually, but he always plays good villain roles and in, including in this movie. And they, and at the beginning of the movie, they do a, a good job setting up Merle as this tough guy. Cause he goes into the bar with this guy he captures at the beginning, who's played by Donald O'Brien, by the way, who played the main character in Zombie Holocaust. He is the Dr. Butcher, the title character in that. And basically they're like, well, how are you going to enter into this $5,000, you know, ante? And he's like, oh, my reward's right here with this guy. (laughs) So then he proceeds to shoot a bunch of the guys in the hand, something similar to The Great Silence, which is pretty cool, demonstrating how fast of a draw he is. But yeah, it's some of the things I really enjoy about this. Nice. Yeah. Um, that's on my list. We will talk about that at a later time. <laughs> awesome. So yeah. Uh, moving on to my number nine, uh, this one may be a little low for some, but for me, I, I've never really been um, as big a proponent of it as um, a lot of his other GLE. I went with the uh, case of the scorpion's tail. Hmm, interesting. That actually, we'll be talking about this one again, but at a at a different yeah at a different spot. <laughs> Let's put yeah. it that way. So yeah, um, this one in, involves a uh, plane crash that uh, claims the life of uh, this wealthy industrialist, and his widow comes to collect the inheritance, only to get caught up in a strange uh, extortion slash murder mystery plot and uh things kind of go from there um not re- you know i mean like with a lot of giallos is really you know not really you know the point to you know spoil it but yeah i I've, I've always found this to be the weakest of his uh gialli. um it just never really clicked for me um i always found felt that it uh, was stuck in like second gear it just never really had that, you know, drive, that sense of urgency that uh, some of his other stuff had. But 
the the main thing for me, and um, I, I know I'm kind of harping on this a little bit more than you know actually liking it, but for me, I've never really liked the idea of the uh, lead character switch that this one pulls off. Um, if you've seen it, you'll know what I mean. But yeah, there's a uh, switch of uh, focus from uh, one character to another. You know, obviously due to you know, I mean, it's a giallo. That's you know not too hard to figure out what happened, but um. The fact that they switch and they do it to a character that we've never really been introduced to before and we're suddenly supposed to care about it kind of just never really rubbed me the right way and it just never really like interested me so uh yeah that's always been kind of one of uh, my downfalls with the film but um other than that i i think it's pretty fun um when it does have uh you know something going on it is pretty interesting there is a few decent chase scenes uh, there's this one inside of a church basement that i thought was pretty interesting and uh there's one inside this um abandoned oh god what was it um i think it was the uh clothing factory or some kind of like warehouse or something i i, I think it's the yeah, I, I mean, I know what you're. I, I know you've seen it, but it's the sequence uh, just before the wife, um, you know, the wife is killed. It's the the big attack where, uh, you know, the the uh, insurance agent comes to save her. But it's the one inside that yep. warehouse. I I've yep. always kind of really liked that one. That one was always kind of a fun little sequence, and you know, the end of you know it was a lot of fun where we get the reveal and all the you know the bag you know all the revelations and you know double crosses that go on there and you know i mean it 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 has a fun picturesque ending but for some reason this one's just never really clicked with me and it's always kind of one that i just you know it's okay it has its moments but it's just never really been one that i've always kind of liked but yeah uh, yeah there's you know a lot going on but uh for me my number nine is case of the scorpion's tail yeah, like I said, um, if you, I mean, if you want me to respond now, I can, or we can talk about it more yeah, later. Yeah, um, at uh, your spot would be easy, would be better. All right. So number nine for me, I have a Polizia Teschi movie that, which I just watched for the first time recently called Silent Action. Uh, I don't exactly remember what the title is. I think it has something to do with Italian Secret Service. But uh, anyway, this is one where. Uh, the beginning starts with a few different sort of military officials all getting killed in various ways, although the newspaper either reports them as accidents or suicides. So the local cop, I can't remember what city they're in here, Milan maybe, but um, he goes he goes to investigate and he's played by Luke Miranda, who is in a lot of Sergio Martino's Poliziotesky movies. People might remember him as the doctor from Torso, who becomes a bigger character toward the end of that movie. Uh, and he... He investigates these crimes, but he also is investigating the death of this electrician who has these sort of tape recordings that could implicate some people uh, within the Secret Service and other military officials. And uh, so he investigates and then he also joins forces with a Secret Service agent played by Tomas Milian, who's probably my favorite Italian genre actor. Uh, he's you know, this is actually a more subdued role for him, but this movie's got some really good sort of shootouts, some really cool fight scenes. And the first half is kind of a, almost like a political giallo that becomes more of an action movie in the second half because there's a mystery to the first half. And it's, you know, uh, Antonio Cazale plays a henchman in it and he's really good at that. Um, people would know his face if they've seen some of th these movies and he was in some spaghetti westerns as well. But there's this awesome scene where him and Luke Miranda kind of have like a Mel Gibson, Gary Busey fight scene where they capture him and Luke Miranda's like, no, I got a score to settle this guy. And they fight and Luke Miranda does all these crazy like stick and move type things where he just dodges every punch and counters him back and beats the hell out of him. It's awesome. Uh, and, you know, I, I like some of the English dubbing in these films, and this one's got some particularly witty dialogue, like this one part where they go to investigate this brothel. This woman's like, hey, like, because he starts trying to investigate, find where the prostitutes are. This woman's like, I got friends in, you know, really important places. And then he's like, yeah, and I have an uncle who's a cardinal. <laughs> and it's like, OK, that is totally something out of the English dub. And I think as this movie goes on, you find out that the conspiracy is just goes deeper and deeper and that maybe – not everything's going to go all that well. So 
Yeah, and this one also just got a a, a Blu-ray release from uh, Fractured Visions, which is really good. Cool. Yeah, I'll uh, have to check that out because, I mean, like I said, uh, my Euro crime experience is uh, relegated to one we're going to talk about tonight, and then the uh, two box sets I mentioned earlier. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, definitely one I'm going to have to uh, look into. So. Uh, yeah, moving on to, uh, my number eight, uh, again, this one, I, I, I kind of feel a little bad leaving it, uh, this low on the list, but, um, yeah, this is just another one. It's never really fired for me as much as I want it to. Um, my pick is your vice is a locked room and only I have the key. So... Again, another one that uh, I may feel a little controversial, but yeah, it, it, this one just it just doesn't have that same kind of impact that a lot of the other ones did. Um, I know it feels weird because you know this is one that has Ed Wige in it, and uh, I mean I, I don't have to tell um, our listeners what uh, she means because I think we're both gonna you know gush over her um, towards the front end of our list. But uh, yeah, this was uh, to me. This is probably her weakest Giallo. Um, I I just don't care about the mystery. I I just don't find her husband that engaging. I don't think he's that fun. I don't think you know his blackouts are all that interesting. I don't think anything interesting is done with him. Their relationship together. It, to me, this one just kind of feels drab. But the one thing that makes up for it is I think this has one of the greatest twists in the genre. And I do like where it goes. I do like a lot of the imagery and, you know, the fact that you're ripping off a lot of Edgar Allan Poe in your gothic horror giallo is always going to be a fun time. So it does have those elements going to it, um, especially when it rips off. Oh, um, I think it's Mask of Amontillado. Um, cause there's that one sequence where they, um, brick them up inside of the cellar. So yeah, I think that's where they take that inspiration from, but yeah, um, on the surface, I think it's got, uh, it's got a few problems, even though, um, there's enough that I like about it that are kind of weighed heavier than the, the issues I have with it. So that kind of keeps it on the lower end, but yeah, this one was just always one that I always felt kind of weird and it just never again never really gelled for me but again because i do have a lot to like with the uh, positives here um i'll go ahead and put it at number eight um your vice is a locked room and only i have the key yeah um we'll be talking about this again later i think i like it a little bit more than you do specifically upon rewatch uh i i mean i'll just i'll say one thing now in terms of like i think he did a good job of like combining the the gothic with the psychological in this one. And he, and he always changes that up for some of his giallos, what he's, what he's trying to do. So, yeah. Cool. And so yeah, number eight. Number eight for me is the suspicious death of a minor, his giallo Polizio Teschi hybrid. And, this one is kind of it starts with basically this woman who's, I believe, a prostitute. Basically, she gets killed. But there's also this um, guy who you later find out was an undercover police officer there. And he tries to track down everything that's going on. And he finds out that it's part of this sort of uh, uh, teenage prostitution racket of sorts and like a, a drug, a, a drug racket of sorts as well as it goes on but i think this one really does a good job combining horror crime and comedy well i think there's comedy when it's pretty appropriate and then the the actual subject matter is treated well like there's a lot of comedy in during some of the action scenes and there's and it's funny that, that this was made during the same year as deep red because there are some similarities there's a murder where a person's you know uh where a person gets thrown through broken glass there's uh, a very organ heavy keyboard heavy score going on uh by someone who martino didn't usually work with he usually worked with bruno nicolai and this one is different i think it's like Luci luciano michelini something like that i think but uh yeah and then <laughs> so there's one great chase scene but it's also great because it, it's a car chase scene where 
it's really funny because of some of the reactions that are going on. And um, maybe you watch this movie, but there's a part where like they, you know, they, they swerve around this one guy and he, he falls to the ground twice and does like this crazy spin on his top hat that I think is just ridiculous, but it's my, my style of comedy. The same thing happens later where like they, they swerve around this guy on a bicycle and they sort of break it in half. So it's a unicycle. And the guy tries to balance on it until he falls off. It's pretty funny. But the murder scenes in this are good, too, because you've got this killer in black sunglasses uh, or, well, reflective sunglasses, which allows for some really cool camera angles with those reflections. But you've got one really good, you know, throat slit, a couple of really good suspenseful kill scenes. So I think it blends those two together well. And this was one of the first times I think he worked with Claudio Casanelli, who he would work a lot more with from the mid seventies to sort of the mid eighties as one of his stars, he kind of went through evolutions with who his stars were at times. And Claudio Castanelli was kind of the star of like his middle period of films. Uh, yeah. My number seven is the suspicious death of a minor. <laughs> oh, okay. So yeah, um, I was kind of keeping quiet there because that one was uh, the next one on my list. Um, so yeah, um, like I said, this is the uh, Polizio Teske outside of the two box sets. Um, ironically, I, I kind of have it a little bit lower on my list because I think some of the comedy is a little weird. Um, I, I, I do agree. I, I thought the idea of the, uh, older gentleman in the middle of the car chase, just spinning all over the place when everybody just keeps rushing by him was, <laughs> was, uh, really funny, but, uh, and then did you like the, uh, sorry to cut you off real quick, but I, I just remembered too. Did you like the part when it was like two people who run their car into each other? And then, like, they're, like, arguing, and then both of the people chasing come and run their cars into their cars. <laughs> that was another yeah. funny part as well. But, yeah, um, well, I was going to say, uh, the thing with the deep red thing is that I think some of the gags are repeated. Because, uh, you know, I think um, Daria's the character, car. the car, she has the wonky car that won't work, and it's the passenger side that won't open. And you know, there's like, you know, several references where his car door, the passenger side won't open. Yeah. So, yeah, um, kind of a little, you know, like that's another one that's kind of, you know, a little on the nose. But if I wouldn't be too familiar with Deep Red um, and I saw this first, I'd probably laugh at that kind of comedy a little bit more. But it's just because I've seen Deep Red that a lot of, you know, those particular jokes feel kind of forced. The the eyeglass gags work up to a point, but then um, I think they just keep going back to that well a little too many times. Like, okay, the one where he's laying in bed with a girl and, you know, he takes his glasses off and she lays on top yeah, of him and rolls over him. and yeah. he's sitting on him. Yeah, that one was funny. I actually legitimately laughed at that one. But then <laughs> yeah. they go back and then, you know, he drops him in the shootout and steps on him. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's like a couple of other times where you see him like walking out of like a prescription glass store. Yeah. But also the uh, the roller coaster shootout is awesome. I forgot about that. That's yeah, that's one of the only movies I could think of where that happens. <laughs> yeah, the roller coaster shootout is fun. That one was kind of unexpected because I wouldn't. I I figured that he would try to like get into one of the cars um, when I saw the setup because I figured okay, well they're gonna do something with the roller coaster because they're they're spending way too much time just like setting it up. You know, like they're walking around and you see it in the background and they're kind of like, you know, trying to like set up like the, you know, they're setting it up where he's at, like at the amusement park. And, you know, as soon as I saw like the one person car, it's like, oh, he's going to be in like the car trailing them or something. But, yeah, I like the way that they handled it where he's like a few like cars behind him. So he's kind of like, you know, diving through them. They're like diving through at various points, but there's like crisscross or like overpass sections where they kind of like have like if not like a full-on like line of sight at each other but there's like you know areas where he can like shoot at him or something but to me the 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 main thing and this is the one issue that i i have the one like genuine issue i have with it is as much as i like the idea of using like the political red tape that is always in these kinds of films i think that ending is just way too tacked on and it just becomes way too preachy like it's just like 10 minutes of him trying to like cut through this red tape to finish off the case. And then like, everybody's just like hounding him for like what he's doing. And it just kind of like feels a little weird and awkward, but 
I mean, other than that, I think the film is a lot of fun. Um, you know, there's like, you know, elements of both. There's like this fantastic murder mystery. I do kind of wish that they hadn't, you know, shown us the full face of the killer. Like just keep like the reflective glasses aspect of it until the end. But, you know, like the kills are pretty fun. Um, you also have, uh, oh, what's her name? Uh, the girl from Suspiria. She's like one of the early prostitutes. Barbara Magnolfi. Barbara Magnolfi, yeah. Yeah, she's one of the um, early prostitutes that gets killed off. Um, you also yeah, if you have. Yeah, you're topless. Watch this movie. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, because there's that one reflection, that one uh, piece in the mirror where she, um, you see her when she turns around, thinking yeah. that you know she's gonna, you know, be, she's like there for her John, but it turns out to be him. Yeah. But. Yeah, and that's all. That also leads to a good fight scene because it, this is one of the few. One of well, it doesn't. Sometimes it happens, but it's one of the few sort of Plesiotesky movies where the hero isn't invincible in fight scenes. Like that fight scene, you almost think he could get killed. It's pretty good. Yeah, it, yeah. I was kind of because, like I said, I mean, I haven't seen too many. So yeah, him being him kind of like needing his friend to come in with the, like the last second just to like make sure to you know like make to like save him. Like that was kind of weird. It's like why you know like he actually like had the henchman do something positive. Yeah, but did you notice that during the the theater scene, it was your vice is a locked room and only I have the key was the movie playing on the monkey? Yeah, yeah, Yeah. that was kind of weird. I was like, oh wait a second, I was just watching that like maybe a month ago. (laughs) Because yeah, I was uh, doing like a little bit of uh, you know refreshing, and that was kind of like you know I'd seen that one like a few films before, but yeah, it was. because I, I I don't remember if I if the poster was outside. Um, I know that's on the marquee though. I think. Yeah. I I think it's on the marquee because you don't see the poster, but yeah, you see the title on the marquee thing. And then yeah, I think it's one of the. Uh, I think I think it's one of the dance sequences, right? It's one of the the party sequence the party scenes. Uh yeah. I mean there is. I don't know if you actually see the film, but there is a. There is an excerpt of dialogue, I think, where they talk about something about a black cat, a black cat driving someone crazy. So I do think it is actually playing in the background. And I don't right. even know. I thought you did see the poster in a reflection, like the Italian poster of it, where it's like that really sort of, uh, you know, uh, almost like Vincent Van Gogh-esque artist thing where it's like that person's mm. face on the keyhole, that poster. Yeah, um, I, I probably have to relook. Um, I, I yeah. I, I knew it was in it because I, I'd seen like, you know, rumors and stuff that it was there. But I mean, I wasn't like specifically paying attention because I didn't know where where in the film it was. And then it's like, oh, movie theater. You know, there it is. But yeah. Um, uh, not really sure what else to say. I mean, you know, with the, you know, revelation of the killer being like the only thing left. But uh, yeah, move on to. Yeah, I mean. It is interesting. The only thing that it's it almost doesn't really matter who the killer is in this movie. It's more like who's actually employing him or who's asking him to do it. So, right. Yeah, that's but, more the center of the mystery. Yeah. I mean, the, the only thing for me and I, I said this before, I didn't like the full face reveal as soon uh, like during the first murder. Like that was yeah. the only w- weird thing. It's like, well, damn, you just ruined everything. But. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, if you do like the traditional thing where you just show like the reflective glasses or something, then that would be, you know, I think that would probably have been like a little more of like a true giallo reveal. But I mean, other than that, I think it's, you know, it's a lot of fun and it's definitely, you know, worthwhile because there's, you know, a lot of elements thrown in that actually do kind of coalesce together pretty nicely. So, yeah, move on to uh, your number seven. My number seven is his first post-apocalyptic movie, 2019, After the Fall of New York. And this one starts with like this, you know, really, you know, traditional narrative voiceover guy with like a deep voice basically saying uh, it's been like 15 or 20 years since a nuclear explosion. And uh, these there's like this European, African and Asian monarchy that basically goes up against this Pan-American Confederacy and they kind of rule the world and anybody who's left in New York, which it's a good title sequence because it shows New York basically in ruins and all this fog and all these, you know, miniatures. And, uh, yeah, the narrative voice basically says, oh, it's been 15 or 20 years. And basically radiation has irradiated the world to the point where everyone is sterile and no one can have children. 
<clears throat> sorry the yeah and then after that it basically the movie focuses on this guy named i think parzifal who's played by uh michael sopke who went on a run as like a b movie star in a bunch of italian movies and you find he's he's in this death match which is pretty cool uh and basically this Edmund Purdom, who is the dean from Pieces, and he's been in a bunch of other movies, basically kidnaps him and says, hey, you're going to go to New York to find the last fertile woman. It's almost like children of men, except this movie is way funner to me. And basically when they go to New York, it becomes kind of like, I mean, it's already been kind of a Mad Max ripoff with like the, you know, the armored cars and the death matches. But it becomes kind of a ripoff of the Warriors a little bit and Star Wars because basically the Uraks have these really cool like Star Wars type guns, like ray guns and stuff. And then they run into gangs similar to the Warriors, New York. Uh, and, you know, there's a ton of really cool, uh, you know, bloody gory moments in this. There's a moment where uh, where I think someone yeah, someone throws like a sword and it cuts like a few people's heads off. That's actually George Eastman who we're introduced to later in the movie. He was in a ton of these post-apocalyptic movies. He's playing like... He's playing a character named Big Ape, who's like the leader of these like ape human hybrids, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then there's like this, you know, this rat, this gang of people who just eat rats. They they come across at one point, too. You've got uh, Romano Pupo, who is a stuntman in Italy, who played a ton of roles in these movies, playing this character named Ratchet, who has like this giant mace. I mean, there's there's a ton of really cool stuff in this movie. And as the movie goes on, you think that this one woman might be the one fertile woman left, but it's later revealed that she isn't. And it leads to, you know, a pretty cool final car chase with the Urax and, and everything like that. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I find this movie really fun. There's not there's not a whole lot to analyze here, which I think is interesting about Sergio Martino's films. They're main, they're mainly just about the entertainment, particularly this one. But I, I don't know. I just find it fun. And, and, and these and these Uraks, these in New York, where they hunt down all these people who, you know, for genetic experimentation, you've got these the people wearing these really cheap, like almost night looking suits where they're wearing like football helmets that you could probably find at like a grocery store on like a display when football season starts. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'll be honest, this, uh, the, the post-apocalyptic stuff is probably my least favorite of all the Italian cult stuff. I was never really a fan of them because I was never a fan of uh, Mad Max. I never really got the appeal with it. So I'm not a huge fan of uh, the post-apocalyptic stuff. I've only seen a couple and um, I, I don't really have like a lot of fun with e with many of them. So is it yeah. Bronx Warriors probably? Yeah, um, Bronx Warriors I've seen. Um, oh, God. Well, there was a, a couple of others. There was one with... Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I re really wish I should have uh, looked some of this stuff up. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, the genre as a whole has just never really been my, my cup of tea. It's like the one like Italian genre thing fair that i've never really cared for so yeah this was one that i haven't seen uh, maybe it's like a completionist thing i probably get to it then but uh yeah it's never really been one that's uh high on my to get to list so um yeah i mean i yeah i don't blame you i i i don't, I don't know i've heard people say they don't like certain genres of italian film i you know, this one was kind of a quick fad. They only made like 15 or so of these movies. It was right after the success of, you know, Mad Max and Escape from New York. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I find this one to be particularly fun, this this particular one. But there are some that are different. One we might talk about later or I might talk about um, isn't necessarily it's it, it's it's somewhat post-apocalyptic, but it is more. I guess dystopian than post-apocalyptic, which might be more up your alley when I talk about it. I don't know. But yeah. what's what's interesting about this movie to me is, at least in, in Cat Ellinger's book about Sergio Martino, I'm, I'm hoping the translation was right. This movie was made for like $1 million, I think, like in U.S. dollars, if the translation's correct. And that to me is pretty crazy because even back then, Star Wars was getting made for like probably like $10 million. It wasn't like a high budget movie like today, but it's still way more than that. And that movie kind of changed the the industry for Italian genre film because they could not catch up to the special effects. Like a lot of these post-apocalyptic movies were 
were sort of really low budget attempts to do it and they kind of just could not do it after a little while. So that kind of Star Wars and some other movies like that actually changed the Italian film industry in a way. And Martino talks about that a lot in his autobiography and stuff. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I I don't really consider it like a, a true post-apocalyptic one, but like the only one that I have actually really liked is Rats: Night of Terror, and that's, that's only a because. Fun movie. But I'm saying like the only reason I like it is because it's so corny and like batshit crazy. Yeah. But um, yeah, like in, a lot of like my you know like the few things that I actually like don't really like about it are like a lot of the post-apocalyptic stuff. But yeah, it's just it, it was never really a genre that really like grabbed me so i mean even like uh you know outside of the italian stuff like i said i mean i was never a fan of mad max i actually don't can't i actually don't really like escape from new york i think it's like carpenter's most overrated film so yeah, I can understand that yeah um i mean a lot of that stuff um even i mean i i, I don't really like consider like a true post-apocalyptic film but even something like uh I know everybody's like really raised about it, like dead end driving. Like that thing is just absolutely dull. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, yeah, like that, like that, that kind of genre has just never really like been my cup of tea. So, yeah, and I just one final thing I'll add. This is one of the only times where I think Martino took a, what you know would usually be considered one of these genre films and actually made it a little bit darker. And more, I guess, more violent than most. Uh, most of the time, his movies were li- on the lighter side. Uh, like you think of Suspicious Death of a Minor. It's not as dark as, say, What Have You Done to Solange or What Have You Done to Your Daughters, when they both have sort of the same concept and idea. And this one does some of the similar things. But this one's definitely way more of like the the darker version of what Bronx Warriors was trying to be, I think. Because the first Bronx Warriors is not very interesting to me because it's not – actually as violent or as dark as I think it could be. Yeah, I, I know that's one I've seen. Um, I mean, I, I really wish I would have done more prep work on the genre, but again, I've never, I'm not a huge fan, so. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, we'll uh, move on to uh, my number six. Uh, this is his uh, sex comedy we mentioned earlier. This is uh, Giovanna Longfai. Um. So, yeah, uh, for those of you that are um, unfamiliar with uh, Italian sex comedies, um, this isn't a prototypical one, but uh, the the general gist of these is uh, horny men trying to get uh, lucky with uh, beautiful women in uh, compromising situations revolving around slapstick sex sex situations. So uh, they try to get women in bed, and then it just turns into like a slapstick routine, but it's all revolving around like, you know, him trying to get her in bed or something. But I, I this has always been, um, I, 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 it's one of the few that I've, uh, I was familiar with long before. Um, I'd seen it years ago just because it was Edwidge, but, um, yeah, real quickly, uh, cause this one may actually be one of the, the rare ones we talk about, but yeah. yeah so it involves a, uh, I, I don't remember what their actual, um, job is cause I, I don't know if there's like an actual job, but it's some kind of um, city worker. He's trying to get in. Uh, he's trying to get in good with the politician in a laboring city that's threatening to close this uh, cheese factory because they're producing too much pollution. And one of the ways that they want to do it is is that they want to get the the guy that the new mayor that's threatening to close it he has a predilection for sleeping with other people's wives so the guy that wants to get in good with him he wants to use a prostitute to flirt with the mayor and get in you know a compromising situation without having to risk the fact that his actual wife is gonna you know do the job so he sends his assistant out to try to find a prostitute who turns out to be edwidge and you know hilarity ensues um yeah this one is just an absolute lot of um this is just an absolute blast um i had so much fun with it edwidge is just absolutely charming uh the fact that you know she seems like the sweet and innocent like you don't really suspect her to go in the direction she does because she actually turns out to be one of the most absolutely over the top just you know foul mouth you know just every other word is you know some kind of you know expletive of some kind and it's just hilarious to see her like going through um 
going through the routines of just like cursing everyone out and trying to, you know, like fit into high society. But yet she talks like, you know, some New York street worker or something. But yeah, um, this is just a, a, a lot of fun. Um, I, maybe five minutes too long. Again, uh, something that we, uh, I've said a lot, but yeah, it's just, you know, it's goofy fun. Uh, a lot of the jokes may be a little outdated and sexist by today's standards, but if you just go in looking to have fun with it, yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of fun. So uh, definitely go ahead and uh, check it out if you can. Uh, don't know if you've seen this one, but uh, for me, I've number seen six... parts of it, but never the whole thing. Ah, uh, okay. Um, so, I yeah. do know it's kind of hard to find. Uh, uh, maybe it's on YouTube for all I it know. Is. I do I know it. it is. I saw, oh, okay. I saw it. Yeah. Cause I, saw I, it. I was able to find it. I, I think it, I think I found it on DVD Netflix cause DVD Netflix still has a lot of the, there was a company called no shame that released a lot of these movies on yeah. DVD and arrow videos actually gotten a hold of some of their bonus features and prints. So I am wondering if they might release these films at some point. I, no, Kat Ellinger has been on them to do it because she's talked about that before. And I, I would certainly buy a few of them if they decided to do it. Maybe like a few famous directors, whatever, and just put a few of their films out. This is definitely one of the more known ones. This uh, La Pretora, which is a movie Fulci did with Edwidge Fennec. Uh, and probably there's a, there's a couple others I've seen. Like there was a there was like a, a, a trilogy she was in. I think a police woman in New York, which is one of the other ones I've seen is one of them. And I don't know. I, I found what I have seen of this because I have not watched the whole thing. A lot of it's early on. I did find it kind of funny and I did find her kind of charming. I think some of the humor doesn't translate quite correctly. I was I was not watching a dub version. I was watching the the Italian language version with subtitles. Yeah, that's um, the there one was on, this that's the one funny on YouTube, moment. Yeah funny moment early on where a character like puts his phone in a fishbowl by accident. Yeah. That, it, that's the type of comedy that's kind of in these, maybe not all of it, but it, you know, it is very slapsticky. And, and you explained earlier what I had said probably a little better where they're not movies that are like chocked full of sex and nudity all the time. You were right about how it usually revolves around men trying to get these women in bed and then slapstick stuff ensues. I, I will say, and maybe this is a different movie. There's a movie I've seen that Fernando de Leo did called Loaded Guns that has Ursula Andress in it. And she's naked like every other scene in the movie, which, you know, fine with me. But it's I don't know. I don't exactly know the consistency of these movies, because that, that one that I just mentioned is is also kind of a Polizia Tesco sexy comedy hybrid but i don't necessarily know the consistency of these movies if if they're going for humor or eroticism uh more all the time yeah uh you like i said i i'm not terribly familiar i've seen a few um i i've seen la pretera but um i cannot recall i i i know i've seen it but i i, I you know don't ask me for anything more than that uh, the only the other one, only other one I've seen from Edwidge. I don't know if you've seen this one. Um, I, I can't really remember the name of it, but I it's uh you know it, it's one that takes place I think during World War II. She's an army nurse that's stationed at this battlefield. Um, like I've heard of that premise, but I don't know the movie. Yeah, um, she like takes like she's like the the head nurse at this um battle um. Like, uh, you know, the station on the front lines and she's like the head nurse there and everybody, you know, up until her arrival is like trying to do whatever they can to get sent back home. But then as soon as she shows up, it turns into a competition to see who can bet her. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I don't remember the name of it because I've seen it once. But yeah, um, I, I like I said, I, I've seen La Pretera, um, La Pretoria. And I've seen that one from her. Um, there's a, a few others. I mean, I've seen a few of um, Barbara Boucher's and uh, I've seen a couple of uh, Dagmar Lassenders because she used yeah. to be, she used to do a lot of um, she used to do a lot of them. And they were they were, those were hers are actually really good. I like her. Uh, I like hers and theirs. Um, yeah, you've seen way more than I have. If you're because I haven't seen any of the ones Barbara Boucher did or Dagmar Lassander. Uh, so and I like both of them quite a bit. 
Uh, there is yeah. one that I'd be interested in. Another one Martino did with Edwidge and Tomas Milian, and I think it's called like Sex with a Smile or something like that. Uh, that I'd sounds kind of interesting. Around, but yeah, that, that that's one that I'd, I'd want to get to as well. Um, well, um, there's one that I do remember. Um, Edwidge and uh, the star of this movie, uh, um, the guy with the nose, uh, what's his name? Um, yeah, I can't remember his name, but I, yeah, I know you're yeah, talking about. Um, He's got a unique looking face and nose. Yep. Yeah, uh, they starred together in uh, a spoof of both of these called, um, like, Forbidden, uh, Forbidden Nose Noise or something. Um, but uh, it's supposedly it's a spoof of both giallos and sex comedies where they both like play like their same kind of characters where Edwidge is naked all the time. And then he's like, you know, the manic guy trying to like, you know, you, you know, he's trying to like get with her, but he's like kind of nervous. So he like ends up screwing everything up. But then he's all like, you know, apologetic about everything. And, you know, it turns out that there's like this killer roaming around that's knocking off like her friends and stuff like that. Um uh, vamp for a second. Um, I, I have Troy's um, Howarth's book here. Give me a second. I can find it. Um, let me see. It's in the second one, which would be in the early 80s. So... Is the Giallo one he did? Yeah, um, the same actor. Um, okay, here. yeah, here it is. Here it is. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, the guy I was thinking of was uh, Pippo Franco. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the name. Yep. Yeah, and uh, it's called uh, Il Ficiniso, or hmm. um, not entirely sure. Let's see. okay. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, yeah, a lot it, of these only have Italian titles too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, it means uh, the nosy one. So yeah. <laughs> kind not of appropriate uh, for for appropriate. Care, with with him in the movie. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah. Um. I was saying that I knew that it's kind of like a send up of both of these, where it's like you know. Half sex comedy, half giallo. So yeah, um, nineteen eighty-one. It looks like so. Yeah, he also, uh, and this is one. This is probably the last thing I say on the subject. Is he? He did. Uh, Martino did one. I think that had Marty Feldman in one of them, and he was particularly proud of that because he's like, "Hey, Marty Feldman is like one of the few kind of stars I got to work with." So, and Marty Feldman, for those who don't know, is the guy with the weird eyes who was in Young Frankenstein. So. Yeah, I, I don't remember if I've seen that one or not. I, I know which one he's talking about because, yeah, I, I've seen him make those comments several times where he was, you know, like you were saying about, you know, getting like a genuine Hollywood actor to star in one of these. So, yeah, I think he, he talks about that and he talked about, you know, how he got to work with Joseph Cotton toward the end of his career. And then he talked about how he got to work with Nicole Kidman once. He said that was like the only time where I got to work with an actual star, like kind of in their prime. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I haven't seen it, so I can't say much. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we'll uh, move on to your number six. This one might be ranked a little bit lower than people might think. Um, so this is Torso. And the I, I have this ranked a little bit lower only. And this is and I'm not really criticizing the movie too much. I'm just saying why I may not like this one quite as much as others. And just real quick, this this movie is split in half in terms of like the first half is kind of a giallo because it has more of an investigation element. And the second half is more of a slasher and a proto slasher in a way, because you've got the the women basically going away from the, you know, the town near where they go to college because there's been murders happening there and they're kind of just going to get away. And this the second half of this movie I like a little bit better. And I think one of the reasons why I might like it slightly less is because it splits those two things in half. And I also think they're, they make a decision toward the end of the movie, which is a cool editing decision. I think when you first see the movie, but upon rewatch, I think it's a little bit disappointing where they don't show a few of the kills and anyone who's seen this movie knows exactly what I'm talking about. And I do like, I do kind of like it as a way to provide suspense later on when a certain character finds out what has happened. But I think upon rewatch, I'm just like, I just want to see the kills and the kills in this one are a little bit tamer than I think in some of his other movies, at least to me, maybe I'm, I don't know. I'm trying to remember all of them. There's one, there's one where, you know, someone pokes the eyes out. That is particularly gory, but I do think there are stronger kills in his other movies, even though the suspense sequences in this one are good. But I think just upon rewatch, I think that harms the movie just a little bit, but 
what I like about this one is it does set up the Giala formula. It's got the people going to this one place where there are not really any th authorities around to help them. They don't really know what's happening, which is a big difference between the Giallo and the slasher is that Giallo movies have more of an investigative element. Slasher movies aren't as investigative. You're, the, you know, the characters really don't know what's going on, even though the audience does until the very end of the movie, which does happen here. And it sets up, you know, the final girl trope of the final girl being more of a sort of pure uh, a woman of sorts. But in the first half, what I do like is how Martino, whether or not he's doing it intentionally and he's still doing it through the male gaze, he's almost making you guilty of looking at all these, you know, beautiful naked women because of the fact that you see it through other people's viewpoints, all these, you know, toxic males that are just kind of pervs for the most part with the exception of a couple of people in the movie. And I think that whether or not he's doing it intentionally, which he might actually be, I think it's an interesting decision because it's like, okay, you like seeing all these beautiful women naked, but uh, I'm going to do it. So you are actually thinking, actually, these dudes are kind of, you know, really disgusting, particularly in that one sequence where they first arrive in the village. And it's Carla Bray who plays the, the black uh, lesbian woman in this movie. And they're basically all saying like all these sort of racial comments about her, which would not be politically correct by any standard uh, today, even though they are kind of funny. Uh, but it's, you know, that's kind of what's going on in this movie. And uh, I think that there's a really good twist with who, with who the red herring is in this. Um, the red herring is actually a pretty interesting character, the, the big one. And uh, as I said before, Luke Miranda, I actually didn't really know anything about him before I saw this movie. Now when I watch him, I'm a lot more fond of him because of the Euro crime movies I've seen and stuff. So I enjoy seeing him play play a bigger role in this as it goes on. And it's got some really good uh, camera moments. And particularly towards the end, that suspense scene where it's uh, Susie Kendall is kind of trying to get away from the killer. You know, she's locked in that one room. That's a really good uh, sequence. And there's a great camera shot where it's just the camera shot from the window where she is overlooking that village, which is totally brilliant, I think. And, um, yeah, I could say more, but that's about all I have for now. <laughs> yeah, um, we will be talking about this at a later time. I figured as much. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that kind of, you know, maybe screws my um, earlier prediction up a little, but uh, we'll cross that bridge uh, when we get to it. Uh, my number five uh, one you mentioned earlier, uh, Menage a Man Called Blade. Um, so yeah, this is uh, my favorite of the uh, Twilight Spaghetti Westerns, or um, maybe my favorite of the 70s Spaghetti Westerns, but um, I still have to revisit Four of the Apocalypse, which I do remember really liking. So yeah, that... I like that movie a lot as well. I don't think it's quite as good as this. It's not as fun as this one is. Let's just yeah. say that much. Four of the Apocalypse is not exactly a yeah a happy I, I know, movie i know what i'm saying is that i i, I do want to revisit it just because of uh, that thing but uh yeah in terms of um i'll, I'll say like you know post 75 spaghetti westerns at least like the twilight era yeah this is definitely my favorite um as we we're saying earlier i i do like a lot of the atmosphere here um i i think it's uh actually far better than what you would expect in this kind of a thing the village just looks incredible i like the setup involving the henchmen i do like the twist where you get the idea of who the henchmen's loyalties lie a little later than what you would expect because i was actually expecting him to screw over you know somebody earlier in the film than when he did so i was actually kind of a little surprised that they held off as long as they did but yeah, the, this is a lot of fun. Um, you know, you you get the, you know, nearly indestructible hero who, you know, takes everyone down whenever he can, you know, very few problems. And then, you know, he gradually just gets outnumbered. And then that's kind of like, you know, you, you see him have to rise up and overtake them that way. Once you know that you, he can take them on one by one, but they have the, they have to use the numbers advantage to get a hold to, you know, take advantage. Uh, as you were saying, I, I do like the, uh, you know, the cross cutting with the massacre and the can can performance. That's that one was really shocking because you don't, you know, you hear the can can music, but then the the massacre sequence is all completely silent as you just see the, you know, squibs exploding and the bodies falling over. And then it just cuts back to, you know, everybody just clapping and dancing and moving and beat with the music. But yeah, the bad guys are just absolutely despicable. The you know the way that they go about it where 
I, I really don't remember if there's a case um, where he never saves the woman he cares about because they shoot her dead in the middle of the saloon. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, she ends up getting shot in the... No, she's not shot, she's stabbed because they pull her up and, you know, they stab her right there in front of... They stab her in front yeah. of because he's yeah, uh, and she's actually kind of a pretty interesting character. I think it's Martine Bouchard who plays her, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but I, I could be yeah. wrong. Yeah, because you figure that they're setting up for this kind of, you know, like, well, he's got to rescue her from his grips. And, you know, like they're going to ride off together or something. But then they end up they, they kill the love interest and during the final trap because they have him buried on the they you know they leave him out to with the rods in his eyes to let the sun dry him out and then they have the yeah the, the sand and I, trap and then they kill her right then and there so i actually i don't know how much we want to give away here but was did he i mean i it, skip ahead like 15 or 30 seconds if you don't want to hear kind of about a detail that happens at the end but did, did he actually go blind is that a real thing or was he kind of faking that? I still don't actually know. No, I, I think the trap is set up to do it if he had been in there long enough. I, I think oh, okay. the friends I think the friend saves him in time. Um, yeah. he's, uh, he, he suffers the effects of it, but I think long term permanent blindness would have happened if he hadn't been rescued. I think that was I think that was the gist of the trap is that he supposedly is going to be, you know, one, he's going to, you know, succumb to the elements because, you know, he's buried in sand and he can't move. He'll, there's the potential for him to be crushed if, you know, he can't extricate himself because he's got all the dirt surrounding him. So, you know, like that's going to like compact him and try to suffocate him as possible. But then there's also the blindness thing because they stick the, the rods in his eyes and they can't like close his eyelids. Because they do that yeah. primitive, they do that thing where they like stick the things like because he has the like the two wounds over his eyelids. So I I think the trap is set up to long term blind him, but I think the friend saves him in time for it to happen. Even though he does end up succumbing to a the, he suffers some effects, but they're not permanent. Um, if I read the film right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm, yeah I. I I, I I would I would need to revisit it to know for sure, but yeah. I I think the way that the setup is the, the the trap is supposed to do it if all goes to plan, but I think the friend who saves him ends up doing it in time to where it saves him from permanent damage, but he does have some short term effects because he does because yeah. he does say that one scene where he shoots him where he ends up saying I you know I thought you were blind and it's like no I said that to test your loyalties. And that's because that's when he comes back with the the henchman and he traps him in the cave and yeah. he, he kills him in the cave. And then he come and then he confronts the, the guy at the end and he says something about you said you were blind. And I was like, no, I said that to test your loyalties or something. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah and I, that I, guy. I, yeah. The, the guy who plays his friend. Well, the guy who supposedly his friend is trying to test his loyalties. Donald O'Brien. Yeah, he's an actor I really enjoy who played, you know, villains in a lot of things. Uh, and, you know, like I said earlier, he's a character in Zombie Holocaust. But we were just talking about for the apocalypse. He plays the like really corrupt, mean oh, sheriff. Oh, that's right. That movie yeah. As well. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And he, I, I always forgot in, that he in was Run, the... Oh, well, you can go ahead. I was just going to say in Run Man Run, he also takes over Lee Van Cleef's role as the bounty hunter. So that's some of the stuff he's done. but. Uh. Yeah, um, I mean, like I said, I, 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 I've always really liked this one. Um, I, I've always had a lot of fun with it. Um, I, like I said, I, I would need to revisit Four of the Apocalypse just to confirm, like maybe my favorite seventy spaghetti western. But in terms of at least post seventy five, yeah, this is easily my favorite. So, I think I like Kioma a little bit more than I do this one. Although the ending to Kioma is really stupid. I'll just say that much. That to me is the that to me is my big issue with it too i've never liked the way that that ended 
Yeah, like, and I'm not talking about like the things that happen towards the end. I am talking about the very end of that movie. Right. I just I find know. really, yeah. really stupid. I, I mean, yeah, uh, that's one where I, I absolutely will not reveal, you know, reveal spoiler warnings. But yeah, no, like the final 15 to 20 seconds of that film, I, I can't stand. I think that's like one of. Yeah, the, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say what happens. I'm yeah, just saying, me either. Yeah. But yeah, no, that, that's what I'm saying is like, like the final 15 to 20 seconds of that film are just absolutely stupid. Blue Underground did DVDs of a lot of these, um, so you can find the DVD pretty easily. The DVD. Oh, Arrow's got the too. Arrow's got Kioma out. Arrow's got Kioma. I was talking yeah. about um, a man called Blade. I'm oh, hoping Menage, that Arrow yeah, gets that, yeah they haven't done a hold of this one at some point and does a Blu-ray for it because I think it deserves one actually. Yeah, because I I did have um, I think I, it was the first one because I think Blue Underground did two pressings. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I have the first one somewhere because um, I went through a period where, you know, I found Martino and I found like a whole bunch of them. I, I actually stupid and, you know, didn't know any better. I actually thought it was uh, another like slasher thriller kind of a thing because it just says like Manaha, a man called Blade. Like he just runs around like using his blade to kill people. So that yeah. was so, yeah, you know, like stupid me. I just bought it because of that. But, yeah, I, I, I really liked it, even though it wasn't, you know, like the horror film. I was expecting it to be, you know, Blue Underground. It's a horror label. You see a guy running around, you know, like man called Blade, like he runs around killing people with it. But, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I definitely love to see like an upgrade to this one. I... I think you could probably do like a, a a new Martino box set for like the non horror stuff, because I I don't know how many more like of his genre fare you can do because I mean I don't know if you want to like have like a little brief thing about it now but Severin has you know all the colors of the dark uh, they have Strange Vice Strange Vice and I think they also do uh, I think they also have Great Alligator River right I think. I think Code Red is the one who has that. Okay, maybe it's Code Red, yeah. Because Code Red, I think, has that one. Um, Arrow's first um, set was uh, Scor- Case of the Scorpion's Tail, Your Vice, and Torso. And I think they also have... Um... Oh, wait, no, Torso was in one of the Giallo Essential Editions because the strange uh, suspicious death of a minor is in the... Yeah, that's the other Arrow one, yep. Yeah, because that one's in the specific Sergio Martino set. So if they were going to do a second set of him, I don't know if there's like too many other like horror films you could do. Like you have to do like the outside stuff, like maybe, I don't know if you've seen this one, um, Arizona Colts. Um, Arizona Colt Returns. I've heard of it, but I have not seen it. I do want to watch it at some point. Yeah, it has saying, like, that's Anthony I... Steffen in it. And I think that that was the first movie he actually directed. Not Maybe right. not the first, but I think it was the first. I, it, when I was looking at his Wikipedia, it was the it's first like, one that. Yeah, like first non-documentary because he did. I think he started yeah. on the Mondo documentaries, and then he did Arizona Colts, and then Strange Vice. Because I think everybody always forget. Everybody always assumes Strange Vice is the first one. It's like, no, it was Arizona Colt. I think Strange Vice just got released first because I think Arizona got held up in court for some reason. If I'm remembering right, I think Arizona Colt was finished first, but I think it was held up in limbo over like some kind of royalties or something and then i think that's what allowed strange vice to come out first so i think everybody always figures that strange vice is the first one i i'm not sure maybe i'm thinking of some other movie but i i think that's i think everybody always assumes that you know strange vice is is like is legitimate debut film and I, i i i don't know if too many are aware that it's you know arizona cult but yeah in terms of like actual like legitimate genre affair, it is Strange Vice, but general like general career, it is Arizona Cult. So, I mean, you can yeah. do that one. You can do Menagea. You can do um, you know a couple of the sex comedies. Maybe even you know like you were saying that Palacio Tesco one that he did. Um, violent. Well, there's game. one. There's one that would be on my honorable mentions called Gambling City that I love that i would love to see a re-release of shame uh, no shame put that out years ago yeah that would be cool if they did like a second second one and they had like you know the the no shame stuff updated yeah because i mean you know 
I don't like I said I don't know if there's too many of the other releases you can do for his catalog because you've already got the you know you've already got the two box sets for his work so if you wanted to like a part two you know you're gonna have to go outside the genre so Cauldron releasing just did American Rickshaw as well I I always forget are those the ones that do all region or is that just uh, region two I think they do all region for that it, it I don't think I don't if anything it would be region A I think it's more of a I think it's I think it's everywhere but they did they haven't done too many releases but they did a great That's one of which is contraband what's what i'm saying i i never know with them because they're one of the few that they they just pop out randomly and they i i i'm not familiar enough with them to know for sure cuz yeah if, if they if they are all region i i'd love to pick up a couple of their stuff but i don't know because i'm I, i'm one of the few unfortunately that's region a locked cuz i stupid me i i never bought the the proper all region player i got the region a one so yeah if they're region b then i don't know but yeah if they're all region or region a then i'll, I'll definitely have to look into a few of their stuff but do you not have a region b no um mine's region a yeah i mean i I kind of had to get a region B as a Euro crime fan because a lot of those are region B. Those movies are not as big in America as they are in Europe. So that's what made me uh, spring for that it was just that genre in particular. And some of 88 films, Giallo's that I can't really get on region A, I don't think. Maybe some of the 88 films ones are region A, I think. But yeah. Yeah. 88 films has just started moving into region A, but a lot of the stuff in region A have just been uh, the Shaw Brothers Kung Fu stuff. A lot of their prints seem to work in region A, which is a weird thing. Even if they say B, like my uh, – they did uh, Hands of Steel and uh, 2019 after the fall of New York, and they say B, but they work on my Xbox One, which is a region A player, which is funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like I said, uh, the only ones that I know for sure that they've done in region A are the Shaw Brothers stuff. So if they are, I'd I'd want to look into those as well. But yeah, uh, I mean, like we were saying with Cauldron, I, I, I'm not familiar enough with them to know. And I don't want to, you know, shell out 40 bucks that I don't have for something that I can't play on my player. So, but uh, I mean, you know, I don't know how much more we want to do about this, but uh, if we want to move on to <laughs> move on, yeah. number, number five. For me, yeah, it is your vice is a locked room and only I have the key. And this is one I've actually enjoyed more upon rewatch. And this is, well, this is not the first one to do this, but Martino does this also in Case of the Scorpion's Tale and Strange Vice, where he's got sort of, let's say, a reveal in the middle about uh, something or uh, someone. I mean, I could, I kind of trying to be subtle about this, that you're like, oh, wait a minute, something else is going on. And then that, that kind of storyline closes off and then it becomes something else. Uh, so this is one of those to do that. And I had almost completely forgotten that it did that, but this one definitely has like the Poe sort of Gothic influence, not as much supernatural. That is more in all the colors of the dark, though it does have some supernatural stuff with the cat, I think, but I, I love the locations in this. I don't exactly know where they shot it, but I, I enjoy the locations. And I think I don't, I don't necessarily flat out disagree with you when you say you don't find stuff interesting. But what I like about this is the three principal actors in this movie, are all playing very different characters from what they normally do. Uh, Edwidge is playing a much more sassier, you know, you know, kind of the bad girl character that she never plays. Um, Anita, Str Anita Strindberg, Strindberg, uh, uh, Strindberg is how I usually pronounce it. But anyway, she plays, uh, you know, a character who you think starts out as a pretty helpless victim. Then it's, it's like, eh, she may not be as much of a victim as you think. And then by the end, you're like, oh, actually, she's the complete opposite of what you first thought. And Luigi Pastilli, who is my favorite Italian born actor, uh, this guy is, you know, he's good in anything he does. This is one of the only movies he started and he's playing, you know, the mean alcoholic character. But I think what his character goes through in this is kind of interesting because rather than just appreciating what he has, because he does, you know, live in this place, he has a beautiful wife and you know, instead of that, he's like, he's just mean and, you know, doesn't seem to care about anything. He's, you know, ends up being kind of a rapist and you think he, he's capable of murder. 
anytime he wants. And also, um, you've got my two biggest giallo crushes, Edwidge Fennick and Anita Strindberg, sharing a lesbian sex scene. Let's just say the room gets uh, hotter when that scene starts. But uh, yeah, I mean, I... I don't know. Some of the imagery in this I really like as well. Like I said, the location, some of the kill scenes, they're a little more brutal than some others. And I this, you know, the gothic influence and, you know, it has a similarity to Hitchcock's Rebecca. There's this one scene where Anita Strindberg puts on like uh, the Luigi Pastilli's dead mother's dress, which he seems to have a weird obsession with that and his cat. So. I don't know. I just I just find there to be a lot of interesting stuff in this. And even uh, Ivan Rasimov not having as big of a role in this as he does in other movies, but still, you know, playing a pretty interesting role as the movie goes on as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I talked about it earlier, so I I, I, I don't disagree. I, I do like the idea that we're kind of given, you know, alternatives to a lot of, you know, our characters as you know, past output, but eh, it's just one where I, I don't really find, you know, Pastilli's character all that interesting. So, I mean, to me, that's kind of like the big thing is I, I just, I, he's like the big thing for me is that I've never really enjoyed that character. So that's always been like the big thing is, you know, what's holding it down. But I mean, like I said, yeah, and I, 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 well, like I said, that was like my big thing with it. So. Yeah, I uh, just for one second, I'm just going to go over something. Uh, the the Italian, uh, you know, the English language uh, dubbing for Italian films is always something that has interested me because I usually watch these films in English if I can. And Luigi Pastilli is dubbed by a guy named Edward Mannix, who's kind of got a deep voice like this. And he's uh, he, he dubbed uh, the main cop in the New York Ripper. And he's done. He's one of my favorite voice actors. One of the reasons I got this in English, the Arrow Video Blu-ray version was was because I saw his voice was dubbing Luigi Pastilli, which is a good combo because he he also dubbed him in Bay of Blood, Mario Bava's movie. So I'm one of the few people who kind of pays attention to that stuff and probably cares about it. But yeah, it's one of those things. I think it gives me like a uh, I don't know a, a greater depth of knowledge where I'm like, oh, this person's voicing this person. That makes for a more enjoyable performance. Sometimes I don't know. Uh, if you have any thoughts or if you choose to watch these films in English or Italian. Um. No, I, I've never really been one to mind um, my my thoughts on it. As long as I see the film uncut, I don't really mind. Um, I I big dubs. Um, I grew up with them. I, I'm fine with it. I've never really been one to like mock or like make fun of a dubbing just because like a voice is off or you know the mouth mouth movements don't match up like i i'm not one that i really care about that i'm much more about being able to understand the story and the plot and what's going on and all that kind of stuff so that's always been my main thing with it but yeah uh one more quick thing about this i just remembered so the woman who dances on the table uh naked at the beginning of the movie during that sort of orgy type sequence where he invites, you know, the hippies in to, you know, humiliate his wife in front of them. That woman is played by Delilah De Lazario. I think in her first film appearance, she went on to star in the pajama girl case and she played the headmistress in Dario Argento's phenomena. Yeah. I was um, reading that, that there was, uh, I, I think her, and I think, um, what was it? Beryl Cunningham is in the thing. She was like the, like the only real like black actress in the genre at the time. Uh, her and Carla Brate, I'd say. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I, I always I forgot about her, but yeah. Um, because I'm saying like those were like, like there were there were only like two or three like genre actresses that you know like the black genre actresses at the time that she was one of them. But yeah, um, I I remember watching. Uh, I remember seeing like you know Dahlia was involved in this one. I I never remember where she was. I always thought she was like, I knew she was like one of the party guests, but I didn't remember which one specifically. So. Yeah, I think it's that one who gets on the table and in the English language version, she's singing something like free yourself, be yourself, something like that. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, moving on to uh, number four, I, this one may seem uh, a little surprising just based on, uh, you know, what I what's gone before. But um, I, I've always been a fan of this one. 
those that know me know me that love uh, creature features. So uh, my number four is the Great Alligator River. And to me, this is uh, one of my all-time favorite uh, cheesy Jaws ripoffs. Uh, you know, you have a little bit more of an adventure feel uh, because, you know, it's all about exploring the jungle and you have like <clears throat> encounters with the cannibal, with the jungle tribe and, you know, like the denizens of the deep forest that don't ha- interact with humanity. But yet they worship this strange God that, you know, this uh, this w- the one guy who um, Richard Johnson, uh, the guy from Zombie, you know, he's part of the inner circle that knows and, and uh, respects them and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I do like the cheesiness of this one. I do like a lot of the encounters here. I do like a lot of the interactions. The I I, I don't really like the fact that they use that miniature gator thing because it's the exact same thing that they do with um, alligator, the one that came the year after, where they have the the miniature croc interacting with the full scale props to make it look like it's a gigantic thing, but you can plainly tell it's the miniature alligator because its features aren't that developed. But yeah, overall, I, I've always been uh, a fan of this one. I have always felt it was, you know, like one of the more underrated entries in that scene because everybody always talks about tentacles. Everybody always talks about Piranha and all the, you know, the other Jaws ripoffs that came out at the time. But this one was always one that kind of got lost in the loop and I never really knew why. Um, and I mean, you know, like for me, I, I, I always found the one sequence where it attacks the boat and you have like the thing just chomping down and everybody and you have like the the interactions with like the full scale prop and you see like all the extras just jumping into the water and trying to like you know get out of its jaws and all that kind of stuff yeah that one was just like so much fun and i've always enjoyed you know mass rampage massacres like that so yeah yeah uh for me my number four is uh great alligator river yeah i don't I well, I obviously don't quite like this one as much as you do because this is not on my list. But I, and I really only find the second half to be kind of interesting. The first half I don't like quite as much, though it does help set up some things. Like I think, besides the creature feature stuff, and I do love that rampage in the second half probably as much as you do. They do a cool thing of like you know trying to uh, make it so you know you understand where like the natives on this island are coming from and how yeah. they start seeing the people as kind of a sacrifice, you know, to that alligator. So they become, they start killing them in the second half, which is totally fine with me, killing a bunch of people going to an island with money. Um, (laughs) But uh, in this one also has a great cast because it's got Claudio Casanelli, Barbara Bach. um, It's got, I think it's Sylvia Colatina who played the little girl in House by the Cemetery. Uh, Richard Johnson has that great cameo scene. Yeah, I, I think that I think that is her, because um, yeah, she's like the featured daughter of the of that one couple that's in the 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 massacre. Because yeah. I, I think there's like two or three couples that they feature in the massacre, and I think she's like the the daughter or something. And then you got Mel Ferrar, who Martino started to work a lot with in some of these movies, particularly his Poliziotesky movies. But in this, he plays basically like an, a precursor to Jurassic Park, the John Hammond character, where he's basically all but saying the same sort of stuff. We spared no expense. There's a lot of cool, like, signs that they have in the movie, like just little things where you're like, oh, this is clearly, like, what something like Jurassic Park kind of became. I mean, I'm not saying it's an inspiration in any way whatsoever, but I just find the similarities kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, I, I'm fine with all that. I, I do, you know, I, I like the setup. I like a lot of the backstory interactions with the, the the tribe. And, you know, you actually do get to get more of an idea of who they're about and what they're doing. But it, I mean, yeah, I, I, I understand why some wouldn't like that, but I, I'm I, I don't mind it because, you know, it gives you some setup and reasoning as to what's going on. But yeah, if you're not a fan of it, I, I get it. I mean, I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm not blindly in love with it enough to, like, not care. But, yeah, um, move on from yeah, there. Yeah, like I said, I moderately liked it. I would probably get, like, a 6 out of 10 from me. So it's not, I don't dislike it or hate it. I just don't find the first half very interesting. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, I think it's because it sets up what happens so good yeah. that, you know, you have, you know, like, great motivation topped off with a great rampage. I think that's kind of what I'm going at is that, you know, you have the best of both worlds, you know, like you have the setup that gets everything going. And then you have the, the massacre, the, the you know, the rampage that, you know, springs from that. And it all feels cohesive and it all feels, you know, it it all comes together pretty well. So for me, I, I think I like that, you know, aspect of it. But, you know, yeah, I, I'm fine with it. So um, we'll move on to your number four. Number four, I have The Strange Vibes of Mrs. Ward, which is his first Giallo movie. And uh, this one, uh, Edward Fennec plays this woman who was previously involved in, you know, kind of an abusive, sadomasochistic type relationship with Ivan Rasimov's character, Jean. And she kind of this, you know, she leaves that life and she's trying to, you know, she marries this, you know, ambassador, kind of this boring guy played by, by Alberto Di Martino, and John is still kind of pursuing her uh, in a lot of ways. And she meets this character uh, played by George Hilden, who I actually think is named George in the movie, oddly enough. And she and he's kind of like a combination of those two people. Like he's got he's a much more stable person than John is, but he has like the fun of you know the excitement that john was probably giving her and i think what's interesting about this movie is it does another one of those things where there's that twist in the middle uh and there's there's a really good um what what i believe is probably a shot inspired by wait until dark where you think you know the killer is off screen and then all of a sudden he leaps across the screen it's a really good moment there's also a shower scene a kill that's also very similar to psycho uh, and there's another good jump scare where I think it's John later on in the movie is pursuing uh, Edward Fennec's character. And there's like a really low camera angle. And then all of a sudden you see him and it goes up high. It's a really good uh, moment. And for me, though, I think what's interesting about this movie is both in this and All the Colors of the Dark, Edward Fennec's character is kind of a victim, but... By the end of the movie, she kind of takes her power back in a way with what happens at the end, at least to me. And I think what's interesting about this movie, there's a bit of a mystery too, like, hey, who's actually doing all of this? Like, who's trying to drive her crazy? And I think there's a really good, you know, a really re- rewarding uh, reveal at the end. And there's some there's some really good, you know, dream nightmare imagery, something that he would do a little bit more of in All the Colors of the Dark. But there's that great one where that first dream she has with John, which which reveals, you know, her sort of, I guess, blood fetish where it kind of repulses her and excites her at the same time. Something that would be very similar to Roman Polanski's repulsion with like repressed sexuality type thing. But, you know, where he or he breaks like the glass and the fragments go all over in slow motion. I think that's an incredible moment. And this one's also got a great uh, Bruno Nicolai score as well. Yeah, um, my number three is Strange Vice. So. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, again, um, you're one slot ahead of me, but um, yeah, I, I I completely agree. Um, I I love the dream at the dream at- atmosphere of this one. Um, you know, you get it, it it makes her life stories, you know, her backstory such an integral part of what's going on that, you know, like you said, you, you feel for her and you start to want to see her overcome the torments. And, you know, you, you have the, the, the dual relationships where, you know, she's got like the three men in her life where she's still haunted by the past, but yet she likes, you know, the more adventurous guy that, you know, gives her more than gives her more freedom than what she's used and what she gets from her current, hu- her current husband. But then you, you know, you start wrapping this, the, the killings all around all that. And yeah, I, I've always really liked this one. It's always been one of the unsung giallos. Um, what, you know, ones I've always pointed to as like the second tier, like we were saying earlier, you know, you gone past, you know, Bava, Argento, and Fulci, then, you know, this is, like, one of the best of the ones that... I, I, I wouldn't say it's always my first choice, but it's always one that I always put in that same category. Like, for me, my first choice, I've I've always said, is uh, Black Belly, this tarantula. And I love fifth, that movie. I've always said Black Belly and Fifth Quarter, like, the first two that are, like, you know, non-big three. 
but then it's always yeah. like in that same sentence where you know like you always start mentioning like the next tier of like the next 10 you, you know hussar die and uh you know red queen kill seven times or uh death walks on high heels it's like you know in that same tier you know you death have walks at midnight is one i love i've always really liked that one too i've always I've never really liked uh, Death Walks on High Heels. That one I've always felt was kind of dull. But Death Walks at Midnight, I've always really liked that one. That one was always a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, the House with the Laughing Windows, a harder one to find in a much different movie, is one I always mention as being one of the best giallos that people don't talk about as well. I've seen that one once, and I don't remember much. I remember the fresca that he sent there, because I remember like the angel figure is like a key figure because they ended up and they turned his identity into it's like some it, it i remember him being th- that figure is like a hidden c- clue to the killer's identity or something but I, I, again i don't remember that one too well because i've only seen it once and i have yet to been able to uh find a new replacement for it so i i i don't have a lot of uh attachment to laughing windows although i i do remember really liking it because um i i do have a, a you know i do have a written review of it online on imdb from like 2006 or 2007 or something like that and it's like a nine out of ten or something so i i do remember it you know i do remember liking it but yeah the house of laughing windows is one that i'm not as uh, familiar on as a lot of the other people um, yeah but yeah, I mean, like I was saying, like, you know, once you're like the, the my original point was that, you know, once you've gotten past, you know, your gentle Fulci and Bava's, you know, the second tier is like, you know, Black Belly, Fifth Court, Hussar Die, you know, Solange and, you know, this and maybe one of the other ones we'll talk about in a few few minutes. But yeah, yeah. this is definitely like, you know, one of the best, if not. I, I, I mean, you know, again, it's number three because there's a couple of others before, but it, it's definitely like, you know, the best of the, the B tier or like, yep. you know, maybe one A kind of a thing where like, you know, the big three are like, you know, A and then like, you know, one A is like, you know, the like this stuff. But yeah, yeah. I uh, one more thing I wanted to mention that I forgot. There's a really good. So Sergio Martino, before he was a director, he did the cinematography on a lot of spaghetti westerns, among other things. And there's a sort of desert showdown late in this movie where that yeah. type of cinematography you can see it particularly there's a really good shot uh th- through reflective sunglasses yeah i've always really liked the way that this one looks because i mean i know like i was we were saying earlier with like you know arizona cult and that sort of thing where everybody figures like you know that you know everybody always assumes that this is his first one and you see like it's you like how slick and professional it is so, yeah, that's always been one of the the big things for me with that one. So, well, for three Martino movies, the, like his first three, you had so a, a Case of the Scorpion's Tail, Strange Vice, and All the Colors of the Dark. You had the same director, writer, cinematographer, editor, and composer, and it's a great combination, all working perfectly. I think. Yeah. So uh, we'll move on to your number three. All right, so <laughs> this is kind of my version of The Great Alligator uh, for you, probably. And some people are going to be like, I can't believe this is ranked this high. But I just have an unabashed love for this movie. And it is his second post-apocalyptic movie, Hands of Steel. Uh, I I think this is just – it's it's such a fun movie. And I think you know people say it's kind of a Terminator ripoff, a Blade Runner ripoff. But apart from a cyborg – this like being you know cyborg being in the movie i think the story is pretty different i mean honestly to me like i don't see ripoff much when i watch this movie and i think it, so it it starts with basically uh john saxon plays this character who's like the leader of this sort of evil industrial company and he wants to kill a guy who's trying to basically spread awareness of uh of the pollution around the world and uh so he hires this half, like 70 percent cyborg, 30 percent man that they create. Donald O'Brien plays the guy who creates the cyborg. And uh, he, you know, he softens the blow at this at the last second to kill this guy. And he becomes more self-aware, sort of like a Blade Runner type cyborg character. And he questions, you know, his existence. 
Uh, so he goes to, you know, Arizona to work in this bar and there he meets, you know, uh, George Eastman's character who's into arm wrestling and he, he beats, you know, several people at arm wrestling, um, which is kind of a precursor to over the top because that was actually after this. But it also does things that I think a lot of sci-fi movies would do, like the sort of self-aware cyborg, the cyborg creator and how he says, hey, he might go to a place that's attached to his mind, like where he used to live or something. That's something that happens in Universal Soldier. And there's like a cyborg on cyborg fight, which I think that happened first in Terminator 2. There's some awesome chase scenes near the end involving like an 18 wheeler versus a car. And Sergio Stivaletti's special effects in this are top notch. And uh, there's a thing that he does in a lot of his movies, whether it's the church or the wax mask later where someone's heart gets ripped out. And that does happen in this movie. There's some crazy, you know, Star Wars looking guns. Uh, and one of my favorite moments is right before the first arm wrestling match with George Eastman. They basically throw this wad of toilet paper at him saying something like if uh, if you're too scared to do this and you're shitting your pants, wipe your ass with this. And then he just, with his, you know, cyborg arm, he just rips off a piece of the marble counter, tosses that. I'm saying, you know, you're on. And then there's this uh, sort of side romance that he has with Janet Agron, who is in movies like Eaten Alive and The Killer, who reserved nine seats. And Daniel Green has always been a fascinating actor to me. I don't know if he's a particularly good actor, but he, Sergio Martino uh, had a habit, uh, like when he went to America, he did not like dealing with unions. And, Daniel Green was a non-SAG actor who was basically, you know, he was built like, you know, an Arnold Schwarzenegger type and he, you know, pretty handsome dude. So he, you know, fit the bill well enough for these roles. But basically he had a small career in Italian films and now he just does, you know, small parts in Fairly Brothers movies. He must be friends with them or something. But I've always found him kind of interesting. And yeah, like I said, I just I think I've talked about, you know, enough about why I love this movie, but and, and the things I love in it. But I I don't know. I just find it fun it's a movie that i could throw on kind of any time and watch yeah um one i haven't seen so um yeah we'll move on to uh my number two uh i'm gonna go with all the colors of the dark mm. so yeah i i've always uh i've always really enjoyed this one um i i do i i i think I've always thought of this one and Strange Vice as really being close in terms of uh, enjoyment. I, I think they're both pretty equal. Um, there's a lot to like with both of them. But for me, the one thing that I actually prefer, uh, the reason why I prefer um, Colors over Vice is I, I think this one gives Edwidge a little bit more to, to do. And in the first one, in uh, Strange Vice, you know, yeah, she does her thing. You know, she gets naked all the, you know, she gets naked whenever she wants. And, you know, but she doesn't really have like that great of a role. Whereas when you look at what she does in all the color in, you know, Colors of the Dark, she has a lot more to work with. And I, I think her character is a little bit more sympathetic and we actually want her to, you know, get on with her life and, you know, figure out what's going on and you know like why are all these people trying to torment her and I, i've always found that that was a lot more impactful and suspenseful when it came to what the killer was doing so for me that one was that's always been like the big thing for me in dividing the two because other than that i think they're both incredibly they're they're both like side by side like they're both compatible and equal in pretty much most ways but because I think this one, you know, gives Edwidge a little bit more to do rather than just, you know, looking hot naked, which I mean, you know, th you know, she does that incredibly well. But honestly, she's not naked all that much in this film. That's what I'm saying. Is that because strange she vice of Mrs. Ward? Yeah, that's what I'm saying is that, you know, yeah, she actually acts in this one and she actually has more to do. And I think that to me is the the, the dividing line, because yeah, she looks great naked and, you know, she does that here too, but she also has more of an acting chop to her, to her, you know, her character goes through a little bit more and I mean, yeah, some of it's, you know, written into the script that that's, you know, what's going on, but the fact that, you know, she does her thing, but then she also incredibly, you know, effectively does this other thing that, you know, we've never really seen before where, you know, 
the the film roles that she's done before i mean you know her role in um five dollars for an august moon really isn't that worthwhile you know she's eye candy and you know not much else and then uh top sensation you know she's just there to do her thing but she doesn't really have like that kind of like big meaty role to work with and this is the one that i think really gives her like the the material to work with and really like bite down on and I, I've always really found that to be one of the big reasons why I think this one's a lot better. And then again, you know, I, I've always really um, appreciated Nikolai's score. That one, to me, I think that's just a little bit more um, memorable and a little bit more remarkable. So I, I think with those two issues, I, I kind of put colors a little bit above Strange Vice. But in, in terms of Giallo's, I think they're both uh, among the best. So... For me, my number two is All the Colors of the Dark. Yeah. Have you seen uh, Ruggiero Diodato's movie Phantom of Death by any chance? I own a copy of it, but I haven't gotten to it. Um, it's it, it's notable because I think it's the only time Edwidge Fennec dubbed her own voice in English. Really? Yep. Yeah. I've and always... there's a scene towards the end of it that shows how great of an actor she really is. I mean, I think she... She really is a great actor to me. Like I've always thought she's more than just something to look at. So, yeah, that to me, I've always looked at, I've always pointed this one as like the film that shows that she was more than, you know, like you said, just, you know, eye candy. But I mean, if you're going to say Phantom of Death, then um, I'm going to have to check that one out because I, I, I own a copy of it. It's in my collection. Shameless. So. I, think. I don't know. Shameless put it out on DVD and you can find the print anywhere. I don't think it's not the greatest print in the world. It's like a VHS print sort of upscaled. Uh, it's serviceable enough, but it's I, I wish it had a better release. But anyway, it's a pretty it's a pretty good movie. And she plays a really good part of it, dubbing her own voice in English, like I said. Nice. Yeah. Like I said, I'm definitely going to have to, you know, at least move it up my uh, my queue then. But. Yeah, we'll uh, move on to your number two. Before I reveal that, I just have a quick aside. So uh, on Hands of Steel, I forgot to talk about this. Claudio Casinelli actually died while making that film in a helicopter crash. That uh, was pretty sad movie. and tragic. Yes, it was. Ah, okay. And so what what happened was they were shooting those particular scenes in Arizona and in the chase scenes in that movie, you can see how dangerous they are. The helicopters low to the ground. There's uh, shots near a bridge, which I believe is what actually happened. But basically, John Saxon, because he was part of the Screen Actors Guild, he had to shoot all of his scenes, uh, aerial scenes in Italy. And he credits that with saving his life because he probably could have been on that helicopter. Yeah, I remember reading that he was that, that I remember reading about that incident, but I have never yeah, the the film in question has always escaped my memory because the uh, the one that I've always like, I I think I've always like kind of credited this one in like Twilight Zone, just because it was like the Morrow's accident. So I I think I've always kind of like credited I've always kind of like miscredited the two in my head for whatever reason. Yeah. But yeah, I, I I heard that story. I I've never uh, the the film in question has always kind of escaped me. So yeah. That's, well, that's why it's so obvious, like towards the end, his character gets killed and it's like a cut. It's like a cut scene and you know, it's not him who gets shot. So it's yeah, that's it's just tragic that that uh, happened. And it made Martino a lot more cautious with stunt work after that because they were actually really close friends. Uh, so anyways, though, my number two is Case of the Scorpion's Tail. And from the first time I watched this movie, I was much more attached to it for some reason i just liked even though the plot could be considered a lot of a little convoluted i just like how much it moves and how much little twists happen because you know the first half kind of belongs to ida Gali, and of course right at the beginning you get maybe the most obvious uh, obvious miniature plane explosion i've ever seen in a movie it's uh pretty glorious but uh you but basically they pull a psycho kind of killing her 30 minutes in and then Anita Streinberg, who I love, plays the journalist character in the second half. But you've also got a lot of different narratives going on because you've got the people 
not only do you have Ida Gali at the beginning, but you have the people who are also trying to collect on the insurance money because she was going to run off with this other woman uh, who is she the one who's played by the woman who's always in Jess Franco's movies? I think it is. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't God. remember her name, but I don't either. Like um, Janine Renaud, something like that, maybe. Um, but that. Yeah, I, I think that's her. Um if she's in it, it then yeah, it, it is uh, Janine Renault, but I think it's her. Yeah. Yeah. I could it, be it, mistaken. I, I think I think I think that is her. Um, give me one second. Let me pull the disc real fast. Um, because yeah, it'll. Um, yeah, I mean, I can keep going too if you yeah, want. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so that, but this movie also has two, probably two of my favorite kills in any Martino movie. It has the one where, you know, you get some really cool camera shots near the door. And, you know, he finally breaks in. But there's that one where he, you know, the razor across the throat, but the blood just splashes all over the the window, which I find awesome. You've got that great scene where uh, Anita Strindberg's character is getting stalked at night in that sort of green, almost night vision lighting. And then there's another kill later on in the movie with a broken glass bottle that I think might be the most brutal kill in any of Martino's movies. It's Giallo specifically. And, uh, you know. Uh, another thing there's again like with the narratives i was talking about you've got kind of four because of what happens to the main character then you've got anita streinberg and george hilton playing the insurance investigator but then you've got these two cops and it's kind of interesting to see them go back and forth because one of them is an interpol agent played by alberto di martino who is also in strange vice of mrs ward and then you've got luigi pastilli playing the sort of, I think, Greek cop who's investigating and the disagreements between them. And it leads to one of my favorite lines I've ever heard in a movie where Alberto Di Martino is like, I think the murderer is a sex maniac. And then Luigi Pastilli is like a sex maniac who kills like, you know, men and women and makes off with like a million dollars. And then he's like, well, even a sex maniac has to pay his laundry bill. <laughs> so I've always <laughs> loved that that line. Uh and as the movie goes on, there are twists and turns, and I think I picked up more on it, my, my second viewing, because at the end of the movie, the sort of explanation ends up being a little convoluted, but I think I pick more more up with it every single time I watch it. Uh, and But there's a scene where, let's just say, involving one character where someone says something like, hey, if you don't actually find this money, uh, you're not going to lose your job or something. And that's like, oh, OK, that makes it more obvious. And I didn't even realize it the first time. But towards the end of this movie, there's this these great scenes on a boat. Anina Strindberg looking great in a bikini and looking even better in like this translucent, you know, transparent purple shirt that she's wearing. But I I don't know. I I find this one great. And it's got some Greek location, uh, great Greek locations when the movie uh, moves there as well. Yeah, um, I mean, I talked about it earlier. So, <clears throat> and yeah, uh, the girl is uh, Janine Renault. Mm, all right. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I guess that uh, moves us to our top spot. So, uh, my number one, uh, I went with Torso. Yeah. So, yeah, Torso is uh, one of my all time favorite films. Um, it's just out of my top 10 i i just bumped it out earlier this year um for a long time it was uh, my number 10 so the one thing i i mean i i don't have much else to add but uh, the, the one thing i do want to talk on uh for me i've always i i, I go back and forth with uh, this one and bay of blood because bay of blood to me is the first film that I I look at as the intermediary between slasher and giallo. And I mean, you and I both know that, you know, slashers and giallos are kind of, you know, they're like the, the redheaded stepchild. They're like, you know, descended from one another. But the one thing that everybody always forgets is that to evolve from one form to another, to evolve from giallo to slasher, you need the one film that combines the both of them. And that's Bay of Blood. Even though, the, for me, Torso does a lot of the same things. It's just Bay of Blood came came first, so I always give that one deference. But in terms of incorporating the slasher with the giallo, Torso, to me, is the one that does both of them the best. And 
you know, the, the, the kills are fantastic. The girls are beautiful. The locations are just as good. And the whole thing is just wrapped up with one of the greatest final 30 minutes. I absolutely love the idea that chase that goes on between them. That is just absolutely fantastic. And you were saying there's those few there's those few scenes where you get the hint that the killers the, the killers in there and he doesn't know that she is and then once it becomes obvious that the killer knows that she's there you now have the chase between the two of them where he knows she's there but she doesn't know that he knows she's there so yeah. the whole thing becomes like you know this incredibly suspenseful thing where she's doing that whole trick with the key trying to you know like knock the key out of the hole and slide the newspaper under to catch the key so it doesn't alert him and then you realize that the key actually did bounce off but then just before the paper disappears underneath he drops the key you see that just that one shot where he drops the key on the thing so that way it slips in and you realize oh god she's done for and then you know, like you get like the last second save and all that, but yeah, to me yeah. that was always like the thing that won me over when I first saw that was just the way that they constructed that final chase, and it was just it's to me I think one of the most underrated chase scenes in the genre, and bridging the gap between Giallo and Slasher. This I I I said Bay of Blood is the one that did it first, but I think this is the one that did it the best. And like you said, the first half is straight up Giallo. The two or three murders that happen around campus, the detective snooping around trying to figure out what's going on and getting the clue with the scarf and, you know, realizing that, you know, the the, the killers bought this item and then, you know, trying to realize the connection between it and the professor. But yeah, the, the second half just turns into the straightforward slasher thing where it's all about, you know, the girls at the villa not knowing that the killer's there and picking them off one by one and then the final chase. Yeah. It's straight up slasher. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I was just going to add something I forgot to say earlier about this was it's got a great dummy death in it as well. <laughs> oh, you're right. Yeah. Cause the finale, yeah. Where they treat the killer. Well that, yeah, but also, yeah, but I'm sorry, I'm just saying, my, yeah. my, no, my uh, furnace might be going off in the background. You might hear a bit of fuzz. Sorry about yeah, that, but just right. for a minute, but, um, so the dummy death where the guy gets hit by the car is what I was talking about. Oh, not the finale. I, I always like the finale. The finale little... as well. But yeah. yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, the, and, the... and go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I was, I was going to say, like, for me, it's like the second best one after Don't Torture a Duckling. Yeah, because the, the, the oh, one in Don't yeah, Torture a Duckling. That. The one in Don't Torture a Duckling, I think, has always been my favorite. But yeah, the one in Torso with it's the ridiculous. Killer... Yeah, the one in Torso is is really fun as well. So, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I forgot about the one with the car. So, yeah, that one was a yeah, there's two in this one. I forgot about that. Yeah, I think and what you were saying about I think this movie, I don't necessarily know. I, I think I don't I like Bay of Blood better than this movie, but I think the way it bridges the Giallo and the slasher is better in this one, because like I said, the, fir- the, the difference between a slasher and a giallo to me is always giallos have an investigation aspect. The characters kind of know what's happening. Um, and in throughout Bay of Blood, there's really no investigation at any point. Like there are characters always trying to bump each other off. And then you've got that sort of mini 30 minutes uh, where those teenagers get killed. And that could almost be its own movie. But there's not as much of an investigation narrative as there is at the beginning of Torso. And, you know, with Torso, I also just love the cast. I love, uh, you know, all the women who happen to be in this movie because they've been in some other movies that I love as well. You know, Susie Kendall yeah. or Crystal Plumage. Uh, I have not seen Tina Olmont and many other things, but I love her in this movie. Carla Brait, who is also in Case of the Bloody Iris. And Conchita Eroldi, who is the one who gets killed in that great scene where the killer stalks her in the mud. She was also in uh, Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward, and then she became a really successful uh, producer, actually. She just produced Dario Argento's latest movie, the Dark Glasses movie. Nice, yeah. Um, I, I knew that there was one from the cast that went into uh, production work. So yeah, that, that may have been her, so. Yeah. 
All right, nice. So uh, let's move on to uh, your number one. My number one is, and I thought it would be yours, and I knew it would be close, is All the Colors of the Dark. <laughs> and I, I love this movie for so many reasons because it, it blurs, you know, nightmare and reality so well that you don't always know what's happening. And that's one of the reasons why I love movies like Nightmare on Elm Street 2 because that does the same thing very well. But this one, I think, and even with the characters, too, I mean, you've got uh, Edwidge Fennec playing Jane, and I, I think her name's Jane. And, um, you know, she she's almost caught between a conflict of, like, what is best to treat her mental health problems, right? It's, like, either pharmaceutical, medicinal, or going to therapy. And then she's like, well, there's a third option, too, that she gets from her neighbor, which is going to a satanic blood cult orgy of sorts, which yeah, actually, that's always what that's always what I do. What? Yeah, as you will. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's last exactly resort, what I do to, to solve yeah. all my problems. Yeah. Last but, resort, <laughs> go to a cult. <laughs> but and also I also think that with the way Ivan Rasimov's character sort of stalks her around wearing those blue contact lenses, I couldn't help but relate that to my own struggles with anxiety where sometimes you just think something you think it's gone and then all of a sudden you're worrying about something just like how all of a sudden she thinks everything's all good and then he just pops up again after she's gone to her first sort of initiation and that whole initiation sequence i love whether it's bruno nicolai's really percussion heavy music the use of the human voice with those like screaming soprano voices at one point and just all the weird imagery but as it goes on, I still love some of the other stuff. There's that sort of what you think, you know, might could be real or a dream sequence towards the end with the, you know, hazy uh, sort of lighting. And then you've got basically what is at the end kind of something similar to what happens at the end of Basic Instinct where a character's like, oh, wait a minute, I've seen this happen before. And that I think is is a fantastic sequence as well. But I also love all the cast and characters in this movie. You've got George Hilton playing a pretty mysterious character as he usually does in these Martino movies, Marina Malfatti, who is in some other giallos playing the neighbor, uh, George Regard playing the psychologist and, uh, Susan Scott, who was a mainstay in her husband, Luciano or Coley's giallos like death walks on high heels, death walks at midnight and forbidden photos of a lady above suspicion playing Jane's sister. And I love also the tattoos this cult has, I, I almost feel like I should I, that, I don't have any tattoos. And that was one of my first ideas was getting that tattoo on like my shoulder blade or something. <laughs> I really like it. But uh, yeah. And like I said, Ivan, uh, Ivan Rasimov is has become one of my favorite Italian genre actors just because he's in so many different genres. He's one of the more versatile actors within the genre. You've got Luciano Pagosi playing the lawyer. And I have not seen any Paul Nashi films. That's a big blind spot for me. Mm. But Julian Ugarte, who plays sort of the cult leader with the, you know, fancy, sharp fingernails. Uh, he's in a lot of Paul Nashi films from what I know. Yeah, I, I've seen him around in a few. Um, I know he's in uh, Frankenstein's Bloody Terror. I think he's the main vampire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, God. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen him in... Um, I mean, he usually plays like the grandfather or something like that, just because he views like getting on. So, yeah. Um, I mean, I think he's in uh, Blue Eyes of the Broken Doll. I think he's in. Uh, yeah, there, there's there's been a couple. I mean, yeah, the the one that I know him from immediately is uh, Frankenstein's Bloody Terror because he's the the, the Coley because he's the vampire. Yeah. In that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of anything else I had to add here. There might be something I'm forgetting, but I can't think of it, uh, right now. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I love this movie and even just some, like I said, some of the camera shots, some of the other stuff, like I love the way this movie opens too, like with the, you know, that, uh, time lapse during a sunset that, that whole dream sequence that happens where you've got that sort of guy with the weird teeth on the tricycle. And then I think you've got. I think it's is it Dominique Bochero who's playing the character's mother who's also been in a ton of other movies, and I think I, I, that sets it right there that this movie is going to be psychological. It's going to be you know it, it's gothic later on with the castles and everything like that. It's got a, a supernatural feel to it, like it's got all that stuff sort of blended together really well to me. I think that's why I love it so much. One of the reasons why, anyway. 
Yeah, I mean, I it's my number two. So, I mean, I, I think we both, I think it's pretty obvious we're both really high on it, so. Yeah, the, the in the first time I ever saw Edwidge Fennick in this movie, because I think this was the first movie I saw her in in a starring role, I basically fell in love with her. I'm just like, that is one of the most beautiful, striking women I've ever seen when I first saw her in this. I can't remember which one I saw first. I think I saw... I, I think I saw Bloody Iris first. I think that was the first one. And then I think shortly after that, I saw Strip Nude. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think those were like the first two. Um, and then, yeah, I went up and I saw... Um, I, I think I saw Vice, and then I saw this one, then I think I saw your Vice after that. And then maybe I've probably mixed in, like, a couple of her non-genre stuff, because I've seen a couple of, like I said, I've seen a couple of her sex comedies as well. So I, I, I can't remember which one I saw first between this one or Strange Vice, but I know I definitely saw Iris, Case of the Bloody Iris first, and I know I saw Strip Nude first. Well, I had actually seen the the Bava film that she was in first. What is it? Five Dolls for an August Moon or something. Um, yeah. I've actually only that, seen that movie once to this day. I still haven't watched it again. She plays like a pretty minor role in it from what I know. Yeah, I didn't I, really I, pay I've much attention seen, to it. I have, I actually only saw that one for the first time last year for Italian Horror Month. Yeah. I mean, it's not a bad movie, but it's certainly not well, one so of Bob's saying, best movies. Yeah, but I'm, I'm just saying for me, that was like the last one because that one was I, I only saw that one first for Italian Horror Month. Yeah. So, yeah, that one was kind of a that one was a blind spot for me because that was one of the only ones of his of Baba's that I hadn't seen. So. But, uh, yeah, I guess that will uh, wrap us up for now. So uh, if we have any honorable mentions or. You know, anything just uh, real quickly shut up before we uh, get on out of here? Yeah, I mean, um, Gambling City was kind of a hard cut uh, for me from this. I mean, I it's one of the Euro crime films that I thought had really cool characters and some really cool death to it. Basically, Luke Miranda plays like this. Um, you know, he plays like this sort of amateur gambler of sorts. He goes into a club and just fleeces all these people by, you know, wearing not so great clothes. And he, he pretends to lose money before gaining it back. And then he gets hired by uh, this, you know, president of sorts who, I, you know, is also a criminal. But basically his son, it's a very commodus uh, and, and Marcus Aurelius relationship from Gladiator where his son's like a really bloodthirsty, mean guy. And he falls, uh, Luke Miranda's character falls in love with the woman he's in love with, who happens to be, you know, that the president's daughter, who's played by Dale Hayden. And eventually they run off together after the son kills the father. And basically it's a pretty cool movie because in the second half, first of all, there's a lot of really good locations in a city called Nice in Italy, I think. But basically he starts going back to gamble and that's how the villains find him again. So it's kind of an interesting like commentary on, Hey, if you step back into your former life, when you should have everything right, they can find you again. And I think by the end of the movie, it, let's just say it's not the happiest ending in the world, but it's also pretty haunting. One of the few Euro crime movies where I felt pretty sad by the end. And uh, yeah. And then American rickshaw is another one I really liked. I watched that for the first time recently because I bought the cauldron releasing Blu-ray and it is just a kind of a, you know, crazy movie. It's it's basically like if Big Trouble in Little China met Blowout or something, where this guy played by Mitch Gaylord, who was an Olympic gold medal athlete, I think, as a, a, a gymnast, he he basically he gets seduced by this woman who happens to be like a prostitute stripper, and basically he takes the wrong video uh, because they were filming, and it ends up being a video revealing where this sort of uh, idol is that has special powers and donald pleasance plays like this televangelist an evil televangelist who wants it back for you know himself and then there's this asian witch woman who who also wants it so she can become her full self again and she's she's portrayed more as the good character whereas donald pleasance is evil and daniel green once again from hands of steel plays this sort of terminator like assassin who's who's going after mitch gaylord's character it's really fun Nice. Yeah, that's uh, one of the ones I haven't gotten to yet. Um, so, yeah, that one's uh, definitely on my list. Um, some of the other ones for me, um, I did have uh, Island of the Fishmen um, or yeah. 
screamers. Um, I actually prefer the screamers cut over Island of the Fishmen. It's got a great um, opening. Yeah, that's uh, uh, as I'm saying. I didn't know which one uh, was your favorite. Um, I don't know if you'd actually seen both cuts or not. But. I have not seen Screamers in its complete form. I've seen the opening, uh, uh, that, that okay. opening 10 minutes or so that was added on. Um, and I, I, I don't mind this movie. I think it, I think I liked it more the second time. Like I like the design of some of the fishmen and I like some of yeah. the sort of underwater miniatures. I find Richard Johnson's character fascinating as always, but I do think there's something there, there's something kind of missing from this film. Like, I don't know what it is in particular because I've only seen it twice, yeah. but it, it it is fun. Yeah, I, 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 I've seen both, but I've never seen them like back to back. So I don't have a lot to say on which one's better. Um, I mean, for those that aren't uh, familiar, uh, the original version is Island of the Fishmen. But when it came to America, it was trimmed down, rearranged. And w- there was a 10 minute opening with uh, Joseph Cotton, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah, Joseph Cotton was uh, tacked on. He's and also it. in the rest of the movie as the professor. Really? I No, because that's Richard yeah. Johnson. No, Richard Johnson is the is like the leader of the island. The 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 father of Barbara Box character, the like scientist guy, that is Joseph Cotton. Oh, maybe I've gotten the two mixed up. Then. I mean, like I said, I I haven't seen them back to back, so I I can't really. I can't really say much for that, but um, there is yeah, some it's... famous actor in the screamers cut. I know that, but yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I mean, that that version and uh, the only the other one I, I really like, and this is uh, kind of an off of off of, off, off uh, beat entry. But uh, I actually really like Mozart as a murderer. Uh, it's um, his haven't last. seen it. Yeah, it's his last uh, giallo. It's a, it's more of a, like a '90s uh, sex thriller. Um, you know, it's a little bit more Basic Instinct influence than uh, anything else, but it's it's not too bad. Um, basically, it's a you know not to get too spoilery, but uh, it's about a woman from a uh, music conservatory that gets killed, and uh, the detective starts investigating and finds all kinds of uh, salacious underground dealings in the uh you know underlings that study there and all the you know red herrings and usual kind of uh you know giallo influences that kind of come about from that so it i i know it's kind of rare um i i assume that's why you haven't seen it but um yeah, yeah. It, it's pretty it's pretty fun um i mean like i said it's a little bit more like sex thriller than straight up giallo but uh, yeah, it's it's pretty fun, and uh, you know, considering it's from 1999 rather than the late 70s, it's uh, better than it is has any right to be. So he hasn't had as much of a late career renaissance as Fulci has, and all of Dario Argento's more late career movies are all available. Some of them suck, some of them are actually pretty good, but he just hasn't had quite the renaissance. Like there's one I was interested in watching called like Mountains of Kilimanjaro, where. Uh, Daniel Green plays this reporter. And what's funny about it, what drew me to it is it's got Daniel Green, who's like, you know, B-movie hunk model, not really that great of an actor. And then you've got Brent Huff playing another role who played the lead character in Strike Commando 2, replacing Reb Brown, <laughs> which I find <laughs> funny. Both of them in the same movie. Uh, yeah. Private Crimes was another one that looked interesting. That was one that he yeah. produced with Edwidge Fennick. Um, from what I had read in Troy Howard's book, it's a little too spaced out with the miniseries. Like there's a lot of fluff in there, but there's still some interesting stuff. Yeah. That was one that I, I wanted to get to for this one, but I couldn't find it. So yeah. That, Another that's... one. Go ahead. Yeah, you can keep going. Sorry. I was going to add one more, but <laughs> yeah, okay. I was going to say, um, yeah, the, a, a private crush was going to be one. And then, um, there was one other th- there was one other one because he did um, like four or five of them in like the early 90s, like right after the, uh, you know, basic instinct uh, craze hit. Yeah, he did another erotic thriller called like I can't remember what that one was called, but there was another yeah. one that caught my attention. Um, yeah, that's what I'm saying, because yeah. I was using I'm saying I, I know you've got the same book I do. So, yeah, I was using that to try to like fill in the gaps because the, there was a, a couple that I, I hadn't seen um, that I was going to do uh, prep work on for this show. 
Um, I, I wanted to do um, private crimes, but I couldn't find it. And then there was, um, yeah, the, the the one that you're thinking of. And yeah, I, I can't remember it either. And I don't want to dig the book out because I just put it away a couple minutes ago. <laughs> the other so, yeah, one, it's... the other one I was going to mention was Casablanca Express, which is the premise of it. I've never watched it. You can find the VHS print on Tubi and YouTube because I did search for it at one point. It's kind of like an Inglorious Bastards type movie, like basically. There's this plot to kidnap Winston Churchill before the like big meeting between him and uh, Stalin and Roosevelt that happened. And uh, the cast is pretty cool. Like Jason Connery, Sean Connery's son is the lead in it. Uh, it's got John Sorrell, who is in a lot of Umberto Lenzi Giallos. Uh, it's got Donald Pleasance, the second movie he worked on with Martino. And it's also got Glenn Ford, which was like that was the name. I was like, Glenn Ford, what the hell is he doing in a Sergio Martino movie in 1989? <laughs> but it just sounds interesting. Yeah, so that, yeah, those were uh, no, I, I I'd seen that one around, but I, I didn't really put too much emphasis on it because I wanted to keep it a little bit more genre specific. But yeah, I, I, I seen that one on Tubi. I, yeah. I, I haven't seen it, but I, I've seen it on Tubi. So, yeah, um, yeah. But uh, and then, yeah, I guess I'll oh, go ahead. Yeah. Lastly, so Cameron Mitchell and Mel Farrar were the ones in the opening of Screamers. That's who I'm thinking of. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Mel Farrar and Cameron. Yeah. Cameron Mitchell should have figured. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I guess that will uh, wrap us all up for the evening. So, uh, yeah. Thanks again for uh, doing this, man. This was an uh, absolute blast. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I always enjoy talking about these films and sort of spreading my knowledge about them. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, before we leave, uh, do we have any uh, internet plugs or uh, things we want to shout out for uh, people that want to follow you and your work? Yeah, you can follow me on uh, at Erzonomics. So it's my last name, I-R-Z-A and Nomics on Instagram and Twitter. You can add me on Facebook if you want. You can follow me on Letterbox as well, where most of the time now I usually just put reviews from my blog. My blog is called The Good, The Bad, and The Macabre. So it's The Good, The Bad, and The Macabre at uh, dot blogspot.com, spelled exactly how you think it would be. Uh, and I'm also going to be doing a I'm, – I'm going to be on uh, Dave Dr. Shock Becker's podcast next week, uh, the DVD Infatuation podcast for – we will be talking top 10 uh, non Dario Argento Giallos, where a couple of movies that were talked about on here might be on there as well. I tried to limit it to two two per director because I was trying to I want to spread, you know, different uh, directors work as well. But, yeah, that'll be up at some point. Nice. Yeah, um, I would assume that uh, that would be out by the time this is released. So I'll have that and all of the other links uh, you mentioned in the uh, show notes down below for you to check out. But uh, once again, thank you for joining me and we will see you next season because uh, this is the season one finale. So I will see you all in the beginning of the new year for round two of the Horror Countdown podcast. See you then.